The Last of Us is one of the most iconic exclusives in the PlayStation catalog. It's genuinely hard to ignore this game given how much discussion has spawned from it. Even as someone like myself who has played Xbox games throughout most of their life, even I couldn't escape it. I've heard for many years how good the series was, and with the show just recently coming to a close, I figured now was a better time than ever to see what it's all about. And similar to what I said in my God of War video, playing it was one of the greatest decisions I've ever made. These games made me feel things I hadn't felt before, and I was fully invested in the story, its world, and its characters. And today, I want to talk about why. As usual, the plan for the video is to not only explain the story of The Last of Us so you have a better understanding of what's going on, but I'll also be critiquing it along the way. We'll be discussing things such as whether or not the story had any plot holes, whether or not the scene had invoked the emotions it intended, and of course at its most basic level, was the story even any good? So without further ado, let's get started. As games get older, more and more opinions start to form. Over the years, I've heard many great things about Part 1. Some have said its gameplay is engaging and its story is captivating. Others have said it's a fantastic PlayStation exclusive and so good that you should buy a PlayStation just to play this game. I've even heard people go as far as to say that Part 1 is the greatest game ever made. I want to start off this section by saying that all of this is 100% true. While I wouldn't personally rank it as the greatest game ever made, I could see the argument for it, and would not be surprised if this showed up on someone else's top 10 list. Part 1 was such a breath of fresh air, as it's been some time since I've played a game that is made of such high quality. I think what continues to blow my mind about this whole ordeal is that it was just one game that caused all of this. These feelings that people have about the series came immediately after it was released. This wasn't something that started off slow but eventually grew on people as more entries came in. This was a hit from the very beginning. And I'm amazed at how incredible the story of this game is when all it's really about is a man and his surrogate daughter. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. We have to start from the very beginning when it was just a man and his actual daughter. The Last of Us at the moment takes place in 2013, and right away we're introduced to two characters, our main protagonist Joel Miller and his daughter Sarah. Already though, we can start to see some of that impeccable quality. Part 1 really excels at conveying the tone of a scene without using words. It can also tell us how characters feel and interact without being blatantly obvious. In this scene, Sarah is woken up by Joel, who realizes that she only has a few minutes to give Joel his present since it's his birthday. Joel is pleased to receive the gift, but the two joke around a bit by having Joel trick Sarah into thinking that the watch is broken, which is then followed up by Sarah's comment about having to sell hardcore drugs in order to afford the watch. You can tell from this short conversation that the two have a deep love for each other, as any father and daughter would. Sarah then falls asleep, only to be woken up again, but this time by her uncle Tommy. Tommy says that he needs to talk to Joel immediately, so we have to go find him. While searching the house for Joel, I started to develop a deep appreciation for this game's attention to detail, as throughout the house are items we can pick up that let us get a glimpse of the world of The Last of Us. It felt like things in this world were put in here with care and consideration. Pictures of Joel and Sarah at a soccer game are set next to soccer balls and posters. All these items give us an idea as to who Sarah is without the game actually telling us. Furthermore, there are a couple of newspapers and a TV broadcast that give us a tease of the events to come. At the moment, there is an infection going around that seems to be spreading far enough for it to be considered a pandemic. People aren't required to quarantine yet, but there are some growing concerns regarding what the future of the world could look like. There is a very obvious, low-hanging fruit of a joke here. I'm not going to take it. In all seriousness, this outbreak seems to be spreading faster than we think, as there are not only cops and explosions going off around the area, but once we find Joel, we watch as he defends Sarah from their neighbor who he thinks is very sick. The incredibly astute observation aside, Joel and Sarah decide to leave the house just in time for Tommy to come by and pick them up. Continuing the theme of portraying a character's emotions and feelings without being blunt about it, the trio finds a family on the side of the road. Tommy wants to pull over and help them, but Joel tells them to keep driving. Tommy wanted to help the family since they have a kid with them, but Joel is only focused on his family. Just after this, Tommy is stuck on the road as people are pouring out of buildings and running for their lives. Tommy doesn't want to drive anywhere though since he's worried that he'll run someone over. Joel couldn't care less. It's not that Joel is a heartless person, it's just that he's pragmatic. He only cares about his family, and if he has to leave someone behind that he doesn't know or drive through some people, then so be it. The town has turned into a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of world, and trust me, you do not want to be eaten. They then end up getting into a car accident and have to run on foot. Joel and Sarah will eventually have to leave Tommy behind and end up meeting with a soldier. But... Yes, sir. Somebody, we've just been through hell. Okay, we just need... Oh no. 
Sarah. Move your hands, baby. I know, baby, I know. Listen to me, I know this hurts me. You're gonna be okay, baby, stay with me. I'm gonna pick you up. I know, baby, I know it hurts. Come on, baby, please. I know, baby, I know. Sarah. Baby. I'm sorry for those who have seen this already and I had to put you through that again, but I needed to play it for those who haven't seen it before. That scene is rough. The whimpering from Sarah as she bleeds to death is painful to sit through. I remember just sitting in silence for a few minutes because I was so shocked at what I just heard. Now I've heard a lot about this series over the last 9 years, so I knew this scene was coming, but this is the first time I've actually heard the scene in full and it was still a gut-wrenching experience. What really sold the scene was Sarah as her voice acting was incredible. Naughty Dog, the team behind the game, really wants you to feel Joel's pain in this moment. He just lost his daughter and anyone with an ounce of empathy could understand the pain he's going through. I personally am not a parent and don't plan on being one for a while, so I don't have any kids of my own, but I felt that pain that Joel was feeling at that moment, because it's not just some guy losing his daughter, it's someone losing the person he loves most, and that is definitely something everyone can relate to. In terms of the prologue as a whole, I can't think of a better way to start the game. The slow build-up to the first infection to the eventual chaos that ensues is very stereotypical, but it's handled perfectly here. Making the player run through these streets also heightens the player's agency. You're not watching the world crumble in front of you, you are in that crumbling world and are forced to run through it. Sarah dying is also extremely important, as the reason the events of the story unfold the way they do could technically be attributed to this moment right here. Overall, it's just a great first impression and succeeds in hooking the player in immediately. That being said, this is a game after all, so the player also needs to be hooked by the gameplay of the game, which by the following section focuses a bit more on that. But they do need to set the scene a little bit, as we do skip 20 years ahead. As with most zombie apocalypses, the infection got worse over time rather than better, which is why the world is in shambles. Joel's also noticeably older and has managed to partner up with someone called Tess. During these 20 years, both she and Joel have been doing smuggling runs for various people. These things they're smuggling involve goods, contraband, ammo, ration cards, or whatever they need at the moment. In terms of their relationship, I never got the sense that they were anything more than friends. They have known each other for quite a while, and Tess on occasion harmlessly flirts with Joel, but both of them seem to have that survival of the fittest mentality. So while it's possible that they may have feelings for each other, it's ultimately not important, as survival is all they care about. However, that doesn't mean that they don't care about each other at all, because Joel clearly cares about Tess's whereabouts and was worried that she was hurt during her recent deal. This deal was something that the two of them were supposed to handle together, but Tess went alone. Thankfully, everything went okay, but after the deal was made, Tess got jumped by some thugs. Apparently, these goons were sent by a guy named Robert, someone the two are very familiar with. Given the state of the world, it's not like the two have a 9 to 5 to go to, so, you know, no time like the present. This then leads into a 40 to 50 minute chapter that is pretty much a tutorial, but a lot of story can be learned from this lengthy mission. From this, we can see the sad world that is The Last of Us, as each area within this quarantine zone is split up into places called areas. Some like the one Joel and Tess live in are in decent condition given the circumstances, but the next area over where Robert is located is filled with trash, dirt, and all manner of questionable individuals. People don't want to talk to others unless they have business, and some guy is selling dogs nearby, likely for protection, but I can also imagine people buying them to make food. Joel and Tess's area isn't without problems either, as rations are running low, someone was just executed in the street because they were infected, and a bombing just occurred moments after. The people that started this bombing are called the Fireflies. The Fireflies are a militia faction that opposes the rule of the military. These bombings seem to be quite common, as we heard about another Firefly bombing in the intro credits, so there seem to be some kind of terrorist organization that is fed up with the military's rule on the people. At this moment in the game though, I kind of found the Fireflies to be quite boring, as they don't really have a clear motivation. This will change once we get to the final chapter, but still, even after beating the game, I found it quite hard to care about them as they never really got much screen time besides the major events at the end. They seem to be a faction that is trying to be the good guys, but in a world like The Last of Us, anyone can consider themselves the good guys, especially when the opening crawl literally states that the government is gone and that the military has taken over. So no faction is really considered good. They just believe that they're good because their viewpoints are opposites of that of their enemies. Given the point of this game's story, which as we'll see is about Joel and a girl named Ellie, I can understand why Naughty Dog wanted to tell a more personal story, but I do think some more info on the Fireflies and the military would have been nice as well. That being said, while we don't learn too much about them, we do get to see some of their operations firsthand, as after Joel and Tess find Robert, Tess puts a bullet in him for doing them dirty before meeting with Marlene, the current leader of the Fireflies. 
This is some incredible timing, as Robert had taken some of Tess and Joel's guns and then sold them to the Fireflies. The duo wants them back, but since Marlene already paid for them, they have to strike a deal. Marlene wants them to smuggle something out of the zone to one of their camps that it can be taken to their lab. That being Ellie, a 14-year-old girl. As creepy and concerning as that sounds, we'll eventually learn that the reason they want her at their lab is because Ellie is immune to the infection. Which is a perfect time to talk about what this infection actually is. So the infection of The Last of Us is called cordyceps. However, unlike some media where it starts with a virus, cordyceps is actually a fungal infection. It functions like a typical zombie virus would, in that bites will turn someone into an infected, but there were two distinct details related to this that I found extremely fascinating. That being that it's based on a real-world fungus, and that the infection is based on time. The cordyceps of The Last of Us is based on the real-life fungus, Ophiocordyceps unilateris. This is a fungus that usually infects ants, however other variations of cordyceps prey on other insects as well. In this case, an infected ant can be easily identified as it sprouts a small branch with what looks like a fruit attached to it. Once infected, the fungus compels the ant to basically find a branch and hook onto it forever. It lockjaws its mandibles to hold on tight, because that branch will eventually sprout from its head. Once it sprouts, spores release from the top and spread across the ground and air, infecting other ants. There's actually a clip of this process in BBC's Planet Earth series that I'll leave in the description. I was going to show it, but I know some of you may not want to look at some dead infected insects. Neil Druckmann, the creative director for the series, took a liking to the fungus as it was based around numbers, meaning the more ants there were, the deadlier it becomes, because 1 becomes 4, then 4 becomes 16, and so on until they're all wiped out. But while Neil liked the disease for its zombie-like qualities, I'm more fascinated with how he managed to change it in the game using time. The Cordyceps fungus has multiple stages, and these stages depend on how long someone has been infected. The first stage is the runner stage. These are your typical zombie infected. Blood red eyes, thirst for flesh, all that good stuff. This usually occurs within a day or two of being infected. After a week or so, the fungus starts to grow, and they hit stage 2, called stalkers. The only visual difference is the small amount of fungus growing out from their body. Once we hit a year though, we start getting into some dangerous territory, as they start to become clickers. Clickers are blind, but have incredible hearing. They're also extremely tough, as they're the first form of the infection so far that can one-shot the player if not careful. If a clicker gets too close, even at full health, you die immediately. The only way to save yourself is a skill in the game that allows you to stab a clicker with a shiv before they bite you. After a few years of the cordyceps infection, these clickers will eventually become bloaters, the final stage of the infection, at least within the bounds of the first game. Bloaters can also one-shot the player with the added bonus of being able to throw the fungus from afar, and are incredibly strong or possibly immune to damage if they aren't hit in their fungal weak spots. Since the clickers and bloaters need some time in order to be created, it's no wonder why we find them in areas with either hundreds of other infected, or in these small spore-filled rooms. These spores are toxic to the human body, which is why survivors need gas masks in order to traverse them. It's unclear what happens when you inhale these, but it's safe to assume you still contract the infection, given it works the same way as the real cordyceps. I absolutely love the way Naughty Dog handled this from a gameplay point of view, as it makes the stronger enemies actually strong, given they can one-shot the player. But from a story point of view, it's a unique version of environmental storytelling. Since the infection is based on time, we can deduce what happened in certain areas depending on that factor. For example, much later in the game, we end up entering a university, and in here are a few clickers and one bloater. This means that these people were likely students of the university, and that they were infected over a year ago. Furthermore, the absence of newly formed runners also implies that either no one has entered this building since then, or that they did but managed to escape. This idea can then be used to determine resource-rich environments. If an area is infested with a ton of clickers, that means a lot of people died here. But that also means no one's been here in over a year, meaning no one has scavenged it for its resources. Now, given that the infection was 20 years ago, it's not a foolproof plan, but still, I like the implications that can be derived from this concept. Just from that summary alone, it's pretty clear that an infected on its own is incredibly strong, and that's not even considering the times that they're all grouped together. But how's that old saying go? kill it with fire? Well, that rings true here in The Last of Us, as fire is your best friend in any situation. If you don't have any fire, though, a stealth kill will work on just about everything minus a bloater. This connects to the gameplay of The Last of Us, which is just downright fantastic. Basically, it's a mix of survival and stealth. Being quiet is the way to go, as while going loud doesn't guarantee death, you will die much faster. You're also forced to scavenge for items and ammo, as you can craft things like shivs and health packs, prolonging your life. The gameplay is in perfect sync with the story, as Joel is running through unfamiliar territory most of the time, so scavenging and making sure you have the proper equipment at all times is critical. Plus, it's a post-apocalypse, so random scrapping gear is laid out all over the place. 
This is unlike other games like Left 4 Dead where guns and ammo are everywhere and crafting items are non-existent. Now, obviously, Left 4 Dead and The Last of Us are trying to be two totally different games, so admittedly it's not a great comparison, but you get my point. What you think people would be doing in a post-apocalypse is exactly what you'll be doing in The Last of Us. It's incredibly realistic and makes for some engaging combat, since ammo is not plentiful. Sometimes you'll have 10 to 20 rounds and be on the top of the world. Sometimes, though, all you'll have is a wooden 2x4 since all your ammo is gone. It's a fantastic survival game, and maybe even a survival horror game, since this game can really scare the shit out of you sometimes. Jokes aside, the gameplay was engaging enough to keep me on my toes from beginning to end, and it's in perfect sync with the story, which is always a plus. Getting back on track, we have to talk about Ellie. As I stated earlier, Ellie is immune. This is shown to us by her as she got bit a few weeks ago and yet feels completely fine. The Fireflies want to take her to their lab so they can possibly manufacture a cure, as Ellie seems to be one of a kind. Joel and Tess are intrigued by the idea of a cure, but as we know, they aren't the type of people to place it above their actual goal of survival. So while they will accept the job, the reason is likely because they want their gear back. Once they make it outside, though, both Joel and Tess get into an argument. Tess is starting to believe the claim Ellie made about being immune, but Joel could care less. He thinks the outside is dangerous and that they shouldn't even be here. If there was one major criticism I had with this game, it's that it's the supposed plot twists aren't exactly subtle. While I did just say it's a major complaint, it's only major because I don't have much to criticize about this game, since in reality, it's just a small part of the game that only happens twice. To explain what I mean, after Joel, Tess, and Ellie get through a large wave of infected, Tess starts to look ticked off for some reason. It's then revealed a few minutes later that she was bit and is going to turn. I feel like this was supposed to be made out as quite the twist as our teammate is going to die, yet it wasn't exactly hard to tell given her sudden change of attitude. Just to reiterate, this only happens twice throughout the game and is by far my biggest complaint of part 1, which just goes to show how good this game is if something this small is my biggest issue. That's why I called the game a breath of fresh air earlier, since it's nice to be able to just sit back and gush about a game without having to talk about something that bothered me, because honestly, not much else really did. For example, Ellie herself is fantastic and is now one of my favorite side characters in gaming, period. Ellie's going to be with us for the rest of the game, and getting Tess out of the picture was likely intended so that the player could get more one-on-one -on -one time with Ellie. We'll meet a few side characters like Tess throughout the game, but a good 90% of the experience is just Joel and Ellie. This is critical because that's the whole point of this game. It's not about the zombie outbreak, it's about these two right here. Whereas some games use the outbreak as the main motivator, The Last of Us uses it as a backdrop, as it influences the rest of the story in the background. If The Last of Us was like other games, then the plot of the story would be to escort Ellie to the Fireflies in order to get the cure. That is of course what we do, but I wouldn't say that's the plot. It's just an objective that is used to move the story forward. The plot is the relationship between Ellie and Joel. It might be a bit hard to understand, but the best example I can give is God of War 2018. In that game, the objective that drives the story forward is delivering the ashes of Kratos' wife, Faye. What's more important, though, is the interactions Kratos and Atreus have throughout the game and how they go from a broken relationship to a repaired one. The Last of Us is similar in that respect, as we're embarking on a journey with Ellie, and the interactions the two have are the most important part of the game. That's why, just like with Atreus, Naughty Dog needed to make sure you care about Ellie in the first place, and they absolutely succeeded in doing so. Ellie is brimming with life and is full of personality, and she's the complete opposite of Joel, which complements him quite well. Joel is an adult, born pre-outbreak, who's always pragmatic and very serious. Ellie is a child, born after the outbreak, who's very naive and more lighthearted. The two get to be further apart if they tried, which is what makes their relationship so intriguing. Joel teaches Ellie how to survive in the harsh world of The Last of Us, but thanks to Ellie's personality rubbing off on him, he starts to be more open with her, being more like a father and less like a stranger. Joel will end up telling Ellie about the world before the outbreak, since Ellie has never known a world without the cordyceps. He'll teach her about the rules of football and explain to her what an ice cream truck was. These are completely foreign concepts to her due to the outbreak changing the world. Furthermore, the game has what is called optional conversations. These are small talks Joel and Ellie will have about certain topics. Such as this one time when Ellie asks why the girl on the poster is so skinny, to which Joel replies that some people just didn't eat so that they could look that way. To Ellie, this is strange since food is a delicacy in the world post-outbreak. But sometimes they're not just talks, but full-on interactions, like later in the game when we meet two people called Henry and Sam. If you enter this one house and stay long enough, Ellie and Sam will play darts for a bit before leaving. The two of them will also reenact a penalty shot a bit later when they find a ball in a net in one of the hideouts. There are so many of these interactions that just add so much depth and personality to Ellie that we could be here all day if I wanted to. I'll spare you most of the details, but still, hearing all of these interactions really makes you appreciate their inclusion. Are 
Are you all right? I'm trying to learn how to whistle. You don't know how to whistle. Well, it doesn't sound like I know how to whistle. <gasps> I'm whistling! Oh, good. Something else you can drive me crazy with. That's awesome. To you? Huh? Yeah, sure, Joel. Go ahead. Take my card. Take all my food, too, while you're at it. By the looks of it, you could lose some of that food. You listen to me, you little shit. No, fuck you! You handcuffed me! I him. need you to shut up. All right? Okay. You guys are killing me with your downer talk. It's joke book time. What is that? Just bear with me. You want to hear a joke about pizza? Never mind. It was too cheesy. I don't get it. Yeah, me neither. What did the green grape say to the purple grape? Breathe, you idiot. <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> but Ellie isn't just great from a story point of view, but also from a gameplay one as well. The problem with making a supporting character that follows the player around is that you don't want to give them too much control or the player will feel like the side character, unless that's intentional of course, but on the opposite end, too little control or power makes them feel useless. By far the best example of a supporting character that I can think of is Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite. She will help the player by opening up tears in the map, allowing you to summon cover or weapons, but she'll also give you ammo and vigor if you're low. She doesn't do any actual killing, but her assistance is incredibly helpful. As for Ellie, in the beginning, she's actually quite useless, but that's because Joel doesn't trust her. Eventually though, he starts to feel more comfortable, which is around the time the game gives her the ability to knife some enemies and even give her a pistol. Once those come into play though, she starts to be a valuable asset to the team. One part I vividly remember is when I was stupidly sneaking up on this two-man group. In hindsight, I should have just let them pass, but I choked the one out anyway. The guy next to him saw me, but before he could shoot, Ellie was already taking care of him and saved my life. Now, ignoring the fact that the guy had a shotgun and for some odd reason decided to get farther away from me before shooting, this is just one example of a time Ellie had helped me throughout the game. Just like how many RPGs such as Mass Effect and Dragon Age subconsciously make you care about your companions by having them help you in combat and by also giving you enough downtime to talk to them, you start to feel more connected to Ellie through those exact methods, which is extremely important as, once again, the entire story hinges on the fact that you even remotely care about her, and I think Naughty Dog did an incredible job at doing so. Once it's revealed that Tess is bit, she tells Joel and Ellie to leave while she distracts the military guards that are coming to kill them from escaping the zone. Tess attempts to fend them off but is eventually put down. Joel and Ellie then escape into the subway station, and we can see that not only can Ellie not turn when bitten, but she can also breathe in the spores without any issue. Once they escape, Joel says that they'll be traveling north a bit, as there's a town there with someone who may have a car. This is also the first time the game has started adding more color to a lot of its environment, as we've gone from a collapsed cityscape to a town with a lush forest. On the topic of graphics, the game looks great, and it's probably pretty obvious by now, but I'm playing on the remastered version. If I'm being honest, the only reason I chose this option was because it was cheaper. The Last of Us has an original, remaster, and remake version. The remake version definitely looks the best, but it received a bit of flack on release. Remaster usually means a technical upgrade. Things like 60 FPS, accessibility features, and other graphical additions are added in these versions. A remake typically means a definitive change from the original, whether that be its gameplay or story. I haven't played the remake personally, but it just seems to be a remaster of a remaster. However, most of these complaints are likely from current fans of the series, which is totally valid, but as a new player, this doesn't really apply to me. If you're hopping into the series for the first time, both the remaster and remake versions are great options. If the question was what version should I play, then I would say that all of the options are worth it. But if the question was, should I pay $70 for a game that has another version that is a third of the price and is readily accessible from the digital PlayStation Store? Well, I think the version I'm playing will give you my answer. Once the two make it inside the town, Joel ends up getting caught in a trap before being rescued by Bill. Bill is the man Joel was looking for, and he's… kind of a nutcase at times. He talks to himself quite a bit and has various traps laid out throughout the town so that no one can enter. He's very particular about his work, traps, and equipment. This is likely due to his long-term isolation. There is no one in the town but Bill by the time we arrive. It's unclear if there were people here but all of them died except for Bill, or he just took residence in an already destroyed town but has been living here for quite some time. One thing we do know though is that there used to be another resident here called Frank, who Bill considered a dear friend and partner. When we find Frank, we see that he has hung himself in one of the houses here in the town. According to our conversations with Bill, it seems like he and Frank were lovers at one point. But it seems like Frank grew increasingly tired of Bill's methods of survival and decided to leave town. 
It's unclear if Frank left but then immediately got bit or just went to another part of town and stayed there for a while, but we do know that he stole some of Bill's equipment and even a car battery, so it seems like he had planned on leaving the town at some point but ended up getting bitten before that happened. This section of the game also highlights another great part about The Last of Us. Even though these characters were only with us for a couple of hours, it hurts to see them go. It's nice to be able to interact and talk with other characters from time to time, but when they leave, the void that was left behind is ever-present. Even though Bill was less than pleased with my arrival, it was nice to be able to speak with him and see how he managed to survive in this harsh world, but now that we have the car, we're not going to be seeing him again. After getting the car, Joel and Ellie with the help of Bill managed to get it running, and the duo drives to Pittsburgh. The welcoming party though is anything but welcoming, as the first people we meet are two hunters. It seems like a large group of bandits have taken over the Pittsburgh Highway, which means getting out of here and back on the road is going to be difficult. As the two traverse through broken buildings filled with stores, hotels, and other shops, Joel ends up getting attacked by one of the bandits. Man. I shot the hell out of that guy, huh? Yeah, you sure did. I feel sick. And you just hang back like I told you to. Well, you're glad I didn't, right? I'm glad I didn't get my head blown off by a goddamn kid. You know what? No. How about, hey, Ellie, I, I know it wasn't easy, but it was either him or me. Thanks for saving my ass. You got anything like that for me, Joel? It's a bit hard to tell since the gameplay can be quite divorced from the story at times, Plus, Ellie usually does a lot of things off-screen, so it's unclear if this is her first kill, but if we just base it off the story and cutscenes alone, this is the first time she's killed someone that isn't an infected. As you would expect, this takes a toll on her, which is why she says that she feels sick. I really like the attention to detail here, as taking a human life can be a very traumatic experience no matter the context. However, this is kind of soured by the fact that Ellie is given a rifle about 15 minutes later and then proceeds to mow down quite a few bandits with no issue, but other than that, it's a really great scene. Although, I did like how before the shooting began, Joel was teaching her the basics of shooting, like how to reload and where to put the rifle stock so that the recoil doesn't knock the gun out of her hand. It shows that Joel is starting to open up more and trust Ellie. Eventually, after narrowly escaping another group of bandits riding around in a truck, the two then meet Henry and Sam. Just like Bill, these two are a pair of survivors that have been trying to make do. You can tell that their relationship was created this way on purpose, as Henry and Sam are similar to Joel and Ellie. Except, instead of a father and daughter, it's two brothers. It's not the exact same situation, but Henry and Joel are both adults who want to make sure their younger partner is safe, and Ellie and Sam are both kids, so they have another person to talk to about kid stuff instead of having to listen to the adults all the time. Henry will also at one point tell Sam that he can't take the toy he found with him because the backpack is only for essentials. His attitude and personality are very similar to that of Joel's in the sense that all that matters is survival. The group then makes it back to Henry and Sam's hideout and discuss how to get out of here, as the bandit patrols are going to keep coming and sooner or later they'll be found. Henry has been trying to leave to join the Fireflies, but due to them being outnumbered, it's hard to find the right time to go. This works out for Joel since he needs to find the Fireflies anyway, since they'll be taking Ellie to their lab just as he was told. This current chapter and the following one are around this middle point in the game where you really don't know what Joel is thinking in regard to Ellie. In the beginning, he was very much against doing this job, and he didn't even want to leave the zone, even if she could be used to make a cure. Now that Joel has had some more alone time with Ellie, he started to care about her more, but it's still hard to tell if it's genuine or simply because it's just a job. What's definitely more apparent, though, is that he has started to take a liking to Ellie, as he's much different than he was four chapters ago. But this does not seem to be a one-sided affair, as while the group is escaping from the truck we saw earlier, they climb a ladder only for it to snap once Joel climbs up. This in the following scene really solidified for me that while Joel may be on the fence in regards to his feelings about Ellie, she most definitely trusts him. Instead of going with Henry and Sam, she willingly goes back down to help Joel. Later, she'll also jump off a bridge into the water once the two are cornered. Prior to this, the game tells us that Ellie can't swim. It also forces us to find ways around that problem, which is why multiple puzzles involve dragging her across the water. Ellie will literally drown if she jumps in here, but she trusts Joel enough to grab her once they land. There was no doubt in my mind at this point that Ellie had taken a liking to Joel and started seeing him as more than just a brutish tough guy that he was portrayed as in the previous chapters. Jumping off the bridge though did seem like certain death, but the two managed to survive thanks to Henry and Sam finding them washed up on the shore. Joel is rightfully pissed at the two for leaving them behind, but Henry's statement of would you have done the same is a fair point. While they are a group, they have only been acquaintances for some time. Ultimately, Henry only cares about Sam and Joel only cares about Ellie. They may save each other if one is being attacked, but if they had to choose, they know who they're picking. 
The four of them will group up and push through the town so they could get closer to their destination until they're spooked by some infected that were hiding nearby. I don't think I need to spell it out for you, but yeah, one of them got bit. And seeing as Sam's attitude starts to change shortly after this, you'd be correct in assuming that it's him. While the reveal isn't exactly subtle, I did like how this was handled. Sam decides to hide his bite mark from everyone for some reason, but this came with the side effect of the cordyceps turning him into a modern day Socrates, as he starts talking to Ellie about death and whether or not the people who are infected are still conscious. It's some thought provoking stuff, sure, but it's very clear that he's only thinking about this as he's trying to reflect on his life and come to terms with what's about to happen. Another detail that is quite important and will be referenced later is that while the two are talking, Sam asks what Ellie fears the most, to which she says being alone. Everyone then goes to bed, and well, what a start to the morning this is going to be. Ellie checks on Sam and sees that he's bit, which wakes up the others. Henry almost shoots Joel over this because Joel was going to kill him first. Henry knows what he has to do though and puts down his younger brother. But the initial shock faded as fast as it came, as now Henry realizes that he just shot Sam, which prompts him to take his own life. I'm a bit torn on whether or not the scene should have ended this fast as it immediately cuts to black and fast forwards to the next chapter, but after mulling it over a bit I think it works both ways. Having it skip right to the next chapter without any warning forces the player to sit with it during the black screen rather than let the scene play out. Plus it could even show that not only is death commonplace in this world but that they have to keep going despite the circumstances. Had the scene played out for a few extra seconds and maybe shown the shocked phases of both Ellie and Joel I think the intended emotion would have come out anyway. I do personally like how fast they skipped over it though, since it really does show how unimportant a single person in this game is, especially if they aren't Joel and Ellie, since their relationship is the main focus of the story. As for where the journey takes us next, well we find ourselves near Jackson, Wyoming, because according to Joel, his brother Tommy, the one we saw in the intro, is located here. Upon arriving, we find out that not only is this true, but that Tommy has found some love in this war-torn world in the form of Maria, and that Joel and Tommy aren't exactly on good terms. Joel and Tommy, after the incident with Sarah, likely worked together to survive, but apparently the two had a falling out due to some disagreements. Tommy eventually ended up joining the Fireflies, which is why Joel is trying to find him, but it seems like he's left that group and is on his own. Joel then wants Tommy to take Ellie with him to the Fireflies laboratory so that the job can be finished. This statement upsets both Tom and Ellie. Tommy has people to protect, and in all fairness, it is a bit rude to just stroll into a settlement and immediately demand they do something for you, but Ellie is bothered by this because that means she'll have to leave Joel behind, and we already know how she feels about that. What are you so afraid of? That I'm gonna end up like Sam? I can't get infected! I can take care of myself! How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing alright so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy! <sighs> Not her, you know. What? Maria told me about Sarah. Ellie? And you are treading on some mighty thin ice here. I'm sorry about your daughter, Joel, but I have lost people too. You have no idea what loss is. Everyone I have cared for has either died or left me. Everyone fucking except for you. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else because the truth is I would just be more scared. This conversation might honestly be my favorite scene in the game, as it's where the story finally takes a turn. Ellie's shown Joel that she cares about him and won't do this without him. This in turn forces Joel to also consider his feelings for her, and just about all of us knew by this point that he does care about Ellie, and that he's starting to see her more as his daughter rather than just some kid. Which is why he decides to take Ellie to the Fireflies himself instead of having Tommy do it for him. He doesn't want to leave Ellie alone, and Ellie doesn't want to leave without Joel. It's not only adorable seeing the two interact with one another, but this was all showcased incredibly well. Seeing their relationship then versus now is almost night and day. Joel started out being annoyed that he has to take a kid with him on a job, and his inability to trust her made combat more difficult. Over time though, he does start to trust her more and more by giving her a weapon to defend herself. Ellie came around much faster, but still, in the beginning she wasn't interested in talking with Joel and Tess, but as things progressed she started taking a liking to Joel, and realized that not only can she not do this without him, she doesn't want to do this without him. This breakthrough in their relationship breaks down that barrier that they had, allowing the two to be more casual with each other. Joel talks to Ellie about football, and the two share what their dream occupations used to be. It all just further confirms that they really are a perfect father-daughter duo, even if they're not related by blood. As they approach the university, they start to realize that no fireflies are here. Tommy said that this is where they were stationed, but no one's here. Not even infected. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time to ponder why that's the case, or where the fireflies went, as while Joel's listening to a recording, a group of men attempt to shoot at him. 
He manages to fend them off, but one of them gets the jump on him. Instead of Ellie taking time to shoot him, she just watches as Joel falls over the railing and onto a piece of sharp debris. Ellie then has to help Joel escape before he bleeds out. This was admittedly a short encounter, but I enjoyed this quite a bit. The stakes were high here, and it felt like I needed to be precise with my timing and accuracy or I was going to fail. Like right in the beginning, when Ellie goes to distract the guy approaching me, but I needed to make sure to shoot him once he turns or he'll kill Ellie. This scene also shows how much Ellie has improved over the course of the game. She's basically running the show at this point, where for the past seven chapters, we've been protecting her. But the game plans to push this to its limit as Joel ends up collapsing once they start leaving the school. Now Ellie has to do this on her own. Before Joel was taking the lead, and even just now Joel was capable of holding his own, but at the moment it's all her. She can't ask Joel for directions or for help, she's the star of the show now. As we could see though, she's managed to handle everything quite well, as the next scene after this is her hunting a rabbit. It's also winter now, meaning it's been quite some time since Joel was injured. Ellie's been surviving for the both of them for at least a couple weeks to a month, and seems to be doing alright all things considered. But apparently the game isn't done torturing her just yet, as she ends up running into a man named David. He tells her that he needs that deer she just shot because the people he's with are very hungry. The two end up trading food for medicine since Joel is sick, but this bodes ill for Ellie, as David here has actually been looking for them for quite some time, as those men at the university were his. Ellie manages to make it back to Joel, but is then ambushed and taken the following morning by David and his men. David, to put it bluntly, is a creep, and likely a pedophile. David says that he has something special in store for Ellie, and one of them calls her David's new pet. He and his group are also cannibals, as we can see someone cutting off someone's limbs. Thankfully, Ellie doesn't give in to any of David's advances, and even takes the opportunity to break one of his fingers in the process. The question arises, though, what do we do now? Ellie's locked in a cell, and Joel's injured. Or is he? Thanks to Ellie giving Joel some of the medicine before being taken, Joel manages to muster up enough strength to stand up and search for Ellie. From this point on, the game will have a switch between Joel and Ellie at different points before the two finally come together at the end of the chapter. This was a major contributor as to why I liked the chapter so much. It was great being able to see both characters move on their own, especially when we go through places as Joel that we just visited as Ellie, knowing that we're getting closer, but we're also still far behind and we need to get to her before something happens. Basically, Joel's sections are about getting to Ellie, and Ellie's are about escaping David and his men. The reason Ellie was even able to escape is that right before they were about to cut her up, Ellie told them that she was infected, and even though we know that's not true, no one knows she's immune, plus she still has the bite mark from when it happened. While the two stand around confused, Ellie stabs James and runs away before David can shoot her. This then leads into that back and forth we talked about where we play as both characters before we reach the climactic fight between David and Ellie. Both of them only have melee weapons, so we have to get in close to stab David. But if he catches you, then you die. There's also glass scattered all over the floor, which will alert David, and after hitting him once, he starts to take cover, which admittedly had me panicking for a bit because I couldn't find him for like a solid minute. Eventually, the two will fall to the ground, and Ellie has to crawl to the nearby weapon, but David gets to it first. I initially thought this is where Joel would arrive and save the day, but I was quite wrong. It's me! It's me! It's me! Look! Look! It's me! He tried to... No, oh, baby girl. It's okay. It's okay. No. It's okay. Just like before, the line delivery and voice acting are incredible, and it really conveys the emotions these characters are feeling at this moment. Ellie just went through one of the most traumatic experiences of her life, and she had to do it all alone. Ellie never knows that Joel is awake until he arrives, so this whole time Ellie felt like it was her against the world, and when she needed him most, Joel wasn't there. Obviously this wasn't Joel's fault, but still, being forced to go through all of this on her own was traumatizing enough, which is why she lashed out. That being said, Ellie was able to hold her own quite well, despite how terrified she may have been. Ellie has already surpassed many of my favorite side characters in other games, but seeing her take center stage for a bit not only confirms just how great of a side character she really is, but it also gave us a very well-developed character arc for her. The world of The Last of Us is used to push the characters into unfavorable scenarios, and this whole chapter was where Ellie was pushed to her limit. She had to do everything on her own, and almost lost Joel in the process. She managed to succeed, but stuff like this won't come without consequences, as right after this we cut the spring, and we can see that the thought of the day is still on her mind thanks to the symbolism of the deer on the wall. But while the world may be cruel, it can also be very beautiful, as her mood immediately changes upon seeing a giraffe nearby. Since Ellie was born post-outbreak, animals like this are like dinosaurs for us, so being able to see one in person is like a miracle. Plus, it's a giraffe. They're adorable. 
The game, like its pacing, handles these mood swings quite well. Ellie just went from butchering a man to death to petting a giraffe in about five minutes, but it never felt jarring or out of place. Ellie is a kid, so it's not uncommon for her to act like one and jump at the next thing she sees right away. The game also wants you to enjoy this moment too by letting you sit and look at the giraffes with her. You're allowed to leave whenever you want, but if you want to stay, then the game will let you stay. It's a very peaceful moment, and after the hours of stress you've likely had at this point, a peaceful moment is very much needed. This moment also prompts Joel to bring up their journey to Ellie. He asks her if this is something she really wants to do. He's totally fine with turning back and going to Jackson if that's what she wants. Joel is really only here for Ellie and doesn't care what happens. He just wants to make sure that this is something she wants to do, because technically this was Marlene's idea, and she might have felt inclined to go because of her. Once you've seen enough of the animals, you can leave the building, which prompts Ellie to give Joel a picture of Sarah and him together. This was the same photo we saw back at Joel's house in the intro, and it also reappears during the chapter with Tommy, as he says that he went back to their home in Texas and took the photo. Joel initially told Tommy to keep it, which he did, before Ellie stole it from them. Minus the short introduction, we haven't really talked about Sarah much, and that's for good reason. The game really pushes her aside as that's what Joel is trying to do. He wants to forget about his past as much as he can. Joel lost his daughter and his old life in one day, and seeing a picture of Sarah likely reminded him of that day. You would think that at the very least he should have something to remind him of Sarah and not taking the photo would be very out of character for him, but not only does he still have the watch that she gave him 20 years ago, but if a picture causes more pain than pleasure, maybe it's best not to keep it, even if it is the last remaining thing you have of a loved one. To get to the hospital, the two will have to take a detour into a tunnel, which just happens to be flooded. One of the bosses they used as a bridge ends up getting caught in the waves and throws the two downstream. Joel saves Ellie, but she needs CPR if she's going to make it but that's when two guards come by and ask him to put his hands up. I love the small detail of Joel not only not listening to them, but not even acknowledging them, as his full attention is on Ellie. Doing this though means Joel doesn't see the gun coming straight for his head, which knocks him out. Thankfully, these individuals were not bandits, but rather fireflies, as he wakes up next to Marlene. The guards just had no idea who they were and that they were coming, which is why they attacked him. To add more good news to the pot, not only is Ellie okay, but they're getting her ready for the procedure, until we discover that it's a surgery. A brain surgery. According to Marlene, the reason Ellie is immune is that the cordyceps attached to her brain has mutated. If they can extract it, then they can reverse engineer it and make a vaccine. But since it's attached to her brain, that means they're also removing a chunk of her brain in order to get it, meaning there is a 100% guarantee Ellie will not survive the procedure. Joel refuses to accept this decision and demands that he gets to see her. Marlene refuses as she knows that Joel will try to take her, so he has her guards escort him out. Joel manages to overpower the guard and get info on her location. Now we then have to battle through dozens of armed men, using anything we can so that we can save Ellie before they do the procedure. Even though there isn't a timer during this mission, it felt as if there was. I was playing more aggressively than normal and would rush into encounters so that I could get to Ellie faster. Joel then meets with the doctors, and it's all on the player to advance forward. No cutscenes or quick time events, you pull the trigger when you want. Did I go a bit overboard with the shotgun? Probably, but it got the job done, which is all that matters. Joel then takes Ellie out of the hospital, kills Marlene, and heads off to Jackson. Joel is incredibly smart, and he knows that Marlene would just come for him later, which is why he's tying up as many loose ends as he can. Ellie will then wake up in the car and ask what happened. See, from her point of view, she fell off the bus in the tunnel and then awoke in a car, but she knows something happened since so she's in a hospital gown. Joel then has to lie to her and says that there were other immune people that they found, but none of their tests worked, so making a cure would be impossible. Honestly, from the moment I killed the doctor to the credits, I was just speechless. So much happened in just a few minutes that I don't even know what to say, and it also didn't help that numerous things I thought would happen never came true. Never in my wildest dreams did I think Joel was going to murder Marlene and then just straight up lie to Ellie about the whole thing. But I quickly started realizing why lying to her was the right choice. Because as the two walk back to Jackson, Ellie talks about the day she got bit and says that it was with her friend Riley when it happened. The two planned on waiting it out, but as we know, Ellie's immune, so her day never came. Ellie has been really suffering with some severe survivor's guilt since before the events of the game, and it's only gotten worse as it went on. She had her friend, who we'll learn about in just a moment, but then there was also Tess and Sam. All these people became infected and died, yet she can't. Just like anyone that suffers from this, you start to question why you were chosen. Why me? Why was I the one to deserve life? These questions can be so strong that some never crawl out from under their weight and just wish that they died alongside those that did. The reason she's bringing this up to Joel is because she wants to know if what Joel said about the fireflies was true. Ellie has been waiting for her turn to die. Technically, she should have died a long time ago, but she was chosen not to, and she's still trying to figure out why. The fireflies gave her the opportunity of a lifetime. She realized that she was destined to live because she'd be the cure that prevents more people from dying. But as we know, Joel took that choice and opportunity away from her. Now, to be fair, Ellie had no idea she was going to die. From her point of view, she fell off the bus and then awoke in the car. 
She had no idea that we visited the Fireflies, stopped the surgery, or even knew that it was a surgery to begin with. So her knowing that info may have persuaded her to not go through with it, but this is something we'll have to revisit when we talk about part two, so there's no point in discussing it now. Circling back to Joel, I think most of us can agree that what Joel did was selfish, but if we were in his position, we would have done the same. Once I heard Ellie was going to die, I immediately tried figuring out what we could have done to stop that from happening. The one thought that did cross my mind during this was how viable a vaccine would have even been. But it seems like I wasn't the only one, as many people for years have been discussing the possibility of this happening. People have also gone a step further and considered what would have happened if they did succeed. As some claim that the Fireflies would have just sold it to people instead of just giving it away so that they could profit, and others have said that a war would have started once news hit that a vaccine was being made. While I'm all for theory and speculation, I think the weight of the ending is lost if the vaccine couldn't have been made. Having the Fireflies fail would make Joel's choice pointless. The game portrays this choice as a selfish and incorrect one. In an RPG, this would have been the bad ending, and having the vaccine not be successful means he would have prevented Ellie from dying for no reason, thus being the good guy. But Joel is not, and never has been, the good guy. He's ruthless, pragmatic, and cares little about anyone but himself and those he trusts. He's not supposed to be seen as a good person, which is why I think the ending would make more sense if the surgery was guaranteed to succeed. Regardless, Ellie and Joel arriving in Jackson means we've come to the end of the game, and already the series is off to a great start. First impressions are incredibly important, especially when it comes to games, and you couldn't have asked for a better start. I absolutely loved this game, and my feelings on it still remain positive to this day. However, we do have to talk about the DLC. I don't think Left Behind is a bad DLC. It's just sort of there, I guess. The DLC covers the two most important parts of Ellie's life, the time she was bit and discovered that she was immune, and then during the winter when Joel was injured. The premise so far is quite good, and I was interested to see where the DLC would go, but I finished it feeling like I got played, as it felt like a cliffhanger type ending, which is ironic given that this is supposed to add context to the scenes that were never showcased. Similar to that winter chapter, we'll be going back and forth between past and present Ellie throughout the DLC. To make it more digestible, we'll just talk about each section separately. In the past, we get a chance to see how Ellie and her friend Riley got bit, and it starts with the two meeting in Ellie's room. This is quite problematic as Riley is a firefly, and Ellie's sleeping at a boarding school hosted by the military, with the intention of creating soldiers to fight the fireflies. Ignoring the fact that Marlene is totally comfortable with employing child soldiers, the rest of the adventure showcases how well established their relationship is. The two end up going to an abandoned mall and just do kid stuff. They goof around in an arcade, take pictures in a photo booth, and just overall have a good time. However, the infected have taken notice of their antics and want to join in on the festivities. Sadly, Cordyceps isn't allowed at this party, so the two gotta bounce. The two girls are capable of handling themselves, but there is quite a few infected chasing them, and it's only after taking down a few stragglers that the two realize they've been bit. Their lifespan has now been permanently shortened, and the two are debating on what to do. They decide to just wait it out and be together in their final moments, but then the DLC just ends. This is what I meant about it feeling like a cliffhanger. The DLC is supposed to show us how Ellie got bit, but we never see the most important part, how she discovered that she was immune. There's no scene showing Riley turn and having Ellie kill her, assuming she even did, and there's no follow-up showing Ellie realized that it's been long enough and nothing's happened. It's just strange that we spent so much time on this relationship and never saw it to the end. Having said that, the relationship between these two is great and shown perfectly. Riley was Ellie's best friend, and being able to see their relationship was great, but I do wish we got to see the rest. The present day plot isn't any better, in fact it's probably worse since nothing of note actually happens. Ellie literally puts Joel in an abandoned store, finds a medkit, stitches him up, and that's all. This is the one part of the campaign where Ellie has to do things alone, yet all she does is grab a medkit. They could have shown her hunting like we saw at the beginning of that chapter, or even how she managed to find the cabin and care for Joel. Just like the other section, it felt like the DLC stopped right when it was getting good. The point was to show how Ellie got bit, but I think they took that too literally, as it only shows how she got bit, and then ends despite the fact that what happens after the bite is more important. The part with Joel was honestly just unnecessary, and didn't need to be shown at all. What's worse is that this was sold for $15. Thankfully the remaster version came with this for free, as if it didn't I would've easily recommend that you don't buy it. Like I said at the top, it's not terrible. It's not great either, but it's not the worst thing in the world. The combat was fun, and seeing the relationship between Ellie and Riley was great but it also doesn't show more of the important parts of these moments, so it just becomes extra content. It's not a bad, nor is it a good DLC. It just exists, and I don't think that's what it should be rated as. It needed to be good, not just for that price, but because it showed us that it would explore these deeply personal moments in Ellie's life, but they didn't deliver on it. 
Regardless of my thoughts on the DLC, as a whole package, The Last of Us Part 1 is an exceptional game. It has stunning visuals, balanced and engaging gameplay, a consistent pace from beginning to end, and a gripping narrative that tells the story of a man and his daughter. Quality like this does not come by often, and you'll be doing yourself a disservice by not playing it. I truly without any hyperbole love this game, and thankfully I'm not the only one who thinks that. The game is considered a must-play on Metacritic with a 95 rating, and was ranked the second most popular PS3 game of its year, just behind GTA V. At a time when people were questioning the validity of gaming as an art form, The Last of Us arrived on scene and proved those doubters wrong. Seeing Ellie and Joel's relationship change over the course of the game made me care for these characters in a way I haven't felt before. Being able to walk, talk, and interact with both Ellie and Joel gave me the opportunity to see how this unlikely pair became partners in the beginning, but by the end would do anything for each other, even if it meant dooming the world. It's a game that I and many others enjoyed and will remember for the years to come, and due to its popularity and critical reception, a sequel was inevitable. And seven years later, the people got their sequel, in the form of The Last of Us Part II, but its reception was less than ideal. There are those that say it's the worst game ever made, and that Naughty Dog should be embarrassed about the product they created. Others say it's amazing and just as good as Part 1. Regardless of your opinion on the game, you can see how drastically things have changed. Just about everyone that played Part 1 was in agreement. This is an incredible game. For Part 2 though, you'll get a different opinion every time. That's how divided the community is on this game. And as for me, I think the game is pretty damn good. I don't consider it to be better than Part 1, but I also don't think it's nearly as bad as people are making it out to be. I understand how bold that is to say, but genuinely, I do think Part 2 is a great game that tells a very compelling narrative about grief. The reason I came to that conclusion was because of the game's second half, which is ironic given that many people think the game is bad because of its second half. We'll get to all that in due time, but I do hope one thing we can agree on is that the prologue starts off really damn well. Part 2 starts five years after the events of Part 1, and it shows Joel cleaning his guitar while explaining to Tommy what happened at the hospital. This was mainly for returning players who needed a refresher, but I liked how naturally it was placed into the story. Tommy is of course hearing all of this for the first time, and while he's shocked to hear what his brother had done, he understands why and says that he would have done the same. While the remake of Part 1 is the graphically superior version, there is one benefit that the remaster has over the remake, and that's being able to see the leap in graphical hardware in real time. One of my favorite parts about playing through a series for a video, especially one that's been going on for a long time, is seeing it evolve over the years as technology gets better. Seeing Kratos go from his original appearance to his newest look 17 years later in Ragnarok is amazing to look back on, and I feel the same way here. It's only been 7 years since the first game, but Joel has undergone some drastic visual changes, and by playing the remake you would be robbing yourself of this moment. While this scene as mentioned before serves as a recap for the player more than anything, the game really emphasizes this moth on the guitar by having it be the first thing the player sees. Neil Druckmann talks about the moth in an interview and says that the moth symbolizes Joel but also compulsion. This guitar Joel uses will eventually be used by Ellie, and this moth is also a design she had tattooed on her so she could cover up the bite mark. It's basically a constant reminder that Joel is always with her, which will be very important going forward. Furthermore, moths are also attracted to light by nature, almost as if it's some kind of compulsion, like they need to find the light. This is core to the game's story, as it's centered around revenge and what revenge does to a person. Its inclusion in the game is subtle, but I liked how heavy the themes and ideas are that surround the image. Once Joel and Tommy finish talking, the two then head back to Jackson, the same town from Part 1. Get your playtime in with Joel while you can, as this will be the only time we actually play as him in the game. That's because our actual main protagonist is Ellie. This was a very obvious decision, as The Last of Us is really about Ellie's story. Joel does play a massive role in shaping the world as we know it, and that event will eventually come back around and influence the entire plot of this game, but it felt like his story was finished in Part 1. Joel ended up getting what he wanted. He was able to keep Ellie safe and give her a new life here in Jackson. There isn't anything he could have done for the story that would make sense without feeling like he was overstaying his welcome, which is why giving Ellie the protagonist role was the most logical choice. The game then switches over to a scene of Joel and Ellie together. It's unclear how long it's been since part one at this point, but it doesn't seem very long since Ellie is still rather young. The two talk for a bit, and the vibe is… awkward. It seems like the talk they had at the end of part 1 is still on each other's minds. Joel attempts to break the ice by playing a song for her. This, like many things in part 2, are callbacks to the previous game. When entering the university, Joel tells Ellie that he wanted to be a singer at one point. Ellie then begs him to sing, but he declines. Well, it seems like she got her wish after all, as Joel does just that. To add to the callbacks, not only did he mention that he was going to teach her how to play, which is something he said in part 1, but Sam's toy, the one Ellie gave back to him, is in her room on a shelf, which just goes to show how much those two impacted her. In both a good way, as they were nice people, but also in a bad way, as it's still a constant reminder that they died and she hasn't. 
We then fast forward four years later, and we get to see the real present day Ellie. Throughout the next couple of minutes, we'll learn that Jesse here and his girlfriend Dina broke up, but then Dina went and kissed Ellie the night before. We also learn that this kiss caused one of the residents to call Ellie a slur. This is one of the few things that bothered me about part two. Some of the game has this tell-don't-show method of storytelling, which is pretty ass-backwards. Even worse, the game does actually show us this incident, but not until 20 hours later, and by then I don't really care. I do like what the flashback shows, because it will become very important later, but I still think Naughty Dog probably could have just shown us the contents now and then reference it later, rather than telling us now and then showing us later. Back to the present though, the plan for the day is to go out on patrol. Jesse will take Tommy and Joel's post, and Ellie and Dina will do their route. This will allow us to get some one-on-one -on -one time with Dina to see what she's really about. Before that can happen though, we're taken to a cabin filled with people. The main two that we see are a guy and a girl named Abby and Owen. There are a ton more people with them, but for now, these are the main two. Abby and Owen are also on patrol, but for a very different reason. They find a hillside that gives them a good look at the town we just came from. Apparently, this group is looking for someone in that town, and they don't seem to be nice people, as Abby suggests that they find one of the outgoing patrols and interrogate them, meaning this group ain't here for some chat and trade. Even with their group, though, they aren't strong enough to take on Jackson, so Abby suggests the previous plan of taking one of the patrols. Owen disagrees, saying that it's too risky, and goes back to the cabin. From here, we'll be switching back and forth between these two until they meet, so let me just summarize all of them one at a time. As Ellie, we end up traveling to some of the outposts and also end up taking a break with Dina so we can wait out the storm. This causes Dina and Ellie to talk about their kiss last night, but Ellie is hesitant to give her thoughts on the matter. One of the game's collectibles are journal entries. These, unlike the other collectibles, allow us to learn more about Ellie and see what kind of mindset she's in at the moment. Ellie has a paragraph in her journal that says, Don't end the friendship. She clearly likes Dina, but she doesn't want it to affect their relationship. Thankfully, Dina feels the same way about her, and the two share a kiss, and even more during their break. The scene overall is quite adorable, as the two definitely seem to care about one another on a very deep level. This is also the first time we get to see one of Ellie's relationships in-game, and it gets you interested enough to see where it goes from here. There was Riley back in the DLC, who Ellie cared deeply for, and then apparently another girl named Kat, who was the one that gave Ellie the tattoo. There wasn't enough, if any time, to see those relationships in action. That's why establishing this at the beginning allows the rest of the story to use it to its advantage. Eventually, they'll be interrupted by Jesse, who says that Joel and Tommy didn't show up and it's been over an hour. The reason they didn't is because they're currently lost in the snowstorm. Abby also happens to be lost too, but thankfully Tommy and Joel happen to show up and save her. The three then get to a safe spot and discuss where to go next. Abby says she has a cabin of friends not far from here. They all agree to go there once they have the opportunity to, and they introduce themselves. While I've always preferred a consistent art style over realistic graphics, one thing it has an advantage in is subtle movements. Just from the facial capture alone, you can tell hearing Joel's name did set something off within her brain, and it's not hard to assume that Joel is the person she's looking for. Now, one common complaint levied at this scene is that it's out of character for Tommy to give out names like this, and I definitely agree. While I could forgive Tommy for the slip-up because he doesn't have the survivalist mentality that Joel has, not only was Tommy a former Firefly for many years, but he just heard the story that Joel told him. It's safe to assume that people would want Joel dead for doing this, and giving away his name was idiotic. The counter-argument to this, though, is that the two brothers have been spending a lot of time in Jackson, living a normal life, so they may have just let their guard down and learned to be more trustworthy than before. Whatever the reason may be, though, revealing their names was the worst mistake Tommy could have ever made. Felt like, like you heard of us or something. Because they have. No! Joel is officially dead. 
This isn't one of those things where he's barely alive and is able to be taken to a hospital, or somehow gets a second wind through the power of friendship. Joel is well and truly dead, and it's only been two hours since we started playing. Now at the moment, we don't know who these people are and why they did this. We could assume that they're fireflies, which is what I assumed too, and I was half right, but we'll talk about the real motivation behind this later. Still though, what a shocking scene. It's a very realistic portrayal of death. Not everyone gets to go out in the blaze of glory. Sometimes they die like a coward, beaten to death with a golf club while they're too weak to move. It's brutal, and not only shows how much hatred Abby had for Joel, but likely how much the player now has for Abby. She didn't even give the man a chance to defend himself. Joel does not deserve to go out like that after everything he's been through, but death and fate are a cruel mistress. Similar to Sarah's death, this too was spoiled for me, but honestly it was quite hard to avoid since everyone was talking about this even before the game launched. I specifically remember gameplay was leaked prior to its release, and everyone took to Twitter and other platforms to inform those of what happened. I was sadly one of those people that had the scene ruined for them, but at the time it didn't bother me since I had no intentions of playing the series. Kinda kicking myself for that now, but just like Sarah's scene, I hadn't heard the scene in full before, and it's still just as gut-wrenching as it's supposed to be. Joel was an incredibly likable character, he was the protagonist of the last game, so we built a deep connection with him, same as Ellie. But now both of us have to say goodbye to him. This event though is what kicks off the real start of the story, and the plan is simple. Kill Abby. Honestly, I don't think anyone playing this game needed any kind of convincing. Once Ellie said she wanted to find her, I was in. Ellie, like myself, cares about Joel, and there's no way we're letting some girl and her gang get away with killing them in cold blood like that. But we don't even know where to begin. Thankfully, Tommy noticed that they had the words Washington Liberation Front on their jackets, which means that they're likely from Seattle. With all that laid out, Ellie along with Dina is then all set to go to Seattle and take the fight to Abby. And Tommy, while originally saying he wants to talk to Maria first, ends up actually leaving before Ellie does, so all of them make the trek across the state. As an opening though, it's pretty well done. Apologies if the last few minutes were filled with more summarization than you're used to, but you could see why it was necessary to speed through the story a bit. There also isn't a whole lot to critique here in this section, since not much has really happened. We've only just been introduced to the new cast, and anything that's happened in the past few minutes was done so that it could influence the rest of the story. Nonetheless, it was still a great start. Some may be disappointed that they killed off Joel this early, and yeah, it doesn't feel great, but it does at least get your attention. Now all the game has to do though is to take this setup and run with it. Abby being out of the picture allows the game to focus more on Ellie, which is where the game really starts to open up in regards to its gameplay. Part 2's gameplay is very similar to that of Part 1. If you liked the previous game for its survival style gameplay, then you'll likely have no complaints when playing Part 2. There are small additions of course, but they're minor enough that they don't change the flow of gameplay. If anything, they enhance it. One of which is where enemies talk to each other during combat and have actual names. It's an attempt to characterize these people you're killing and really hammer home how much destruction you're doing. The original game had stuff like this too, like when enemies would announce that you have no ammo if you try to shoot an empty magazine, but Part 2 takes this to another level. As for the complaints, I really only have one, and that's that Ellie likes to announce when all the enemies are dead. She'll say something like, okay, I think that's all of them, or something along those lines at the end of every encounter. I get why they did this, but I feel like it removes the feeling of suspense that Part 1 kept throughout its runtime. For example, a little bit later Ellie will run into a group of stalkers, but this time they actually stalk the player. They'll hide behind these walls and jump you if you don't see them. It's a terrifying encounter, but once they're dead, Ellie says that the coast is clear. Knowing that the area is clear of hostiles, I sprinted throughout the area picking up any loose items I didn't find since I was so focused on killing. Had that not been included, I would have just left as I was already at the exit. But since Ellie said that they were all dead, I ran around without a care in the world. It just kills the suspense of not knowing whether or not every enemy in the area is truly dead. Other than that though, the gameplay was just as great as the original, and if you play The Last of Us for the gameplay alone, you won't be disappointed. The next few minutes are a mix of gameplay and puzzle solving just like the previous games, but there are a few moments where the game focuses on our two lovebirds. I must say though, I think Part 2 really drops the ball on the side characters. Jesse and Dina are likable enough, but they're never really given an opportunity to express themselves in any way. One note would be a perfect way to describe them, because in this game it's not about what makes them interesting, but what their role is to the story. There isn't enough info given to us about Dina to make her interesting, but her role is Ellie's girlfriend. Her role is important, but everything about her isn't, which is a real shame. I know the focus of this game, at least for now, was on Ellie, but I do wish more time was spent with the others. I want to see what Ellie sees in Dina, and why she's so special to her. As for that particular moment I mentioned earlier, Ellie found a guitar and decides to play a tune for Dina. The scene, just like the one earlier in the weed den, are adorable, and I wish I got to see more of it throughout the game. Once again, I know the focal point of the story is Ellie, but focusing so much on her comes at the cost of the other characters that surround her. Once Ellie is done singing, she and Dina will eventually make it to one of the WLF outposts and find some of Tommy's handiwork. 
This is very similar to Joel's style of interrogation, which was that scene during the winter. Seems like Tommy made the guy write down some coordinates in his own blood, which is pretty gruesome. The two will then follow the trail before being blown up by a landmine. Ellie's then knocked out before waking up next to Jordan. Jordan is the guy from earlier who was slashed in the face. Instead of killing her, he wants to keep Ellie alive though so that he can get some more information on who else she's traveling with. But the guy next to him, Mike, argues with Jordan, saying that Isaac, leader of the WLF, has a new mandate, kill all trespassers. Their argument gives Dina enough time to come by and kill Mike before Jordan shoots the glass, causing her to fall. Jordan then, for some odd reason, decides to choke Dina out, which gives Ellie enough time to escape and kill Jordan. Overall, the scene is as intense as it's intended to be, but I'm still puzzled as to why Jordan didn't just kill Dina. It's hard to know what Jordan wanted with Dina specifically, as he could have just wanted her as another hostage to interrogate for information, but it's also possible that he just wanted to kill her. Assuming he really did just want to kill her, it's definitely very odd he didn't just finish her off with the gun he was already using on her. Things like this can be very tricky in stories as you want to add tension and suspense to engage the viewer, but sometimes the action that causes said suspense, like choking someone instead of shooting them, doesn't make any sense in the context of the situation. Jordan dying though allows Ellie to find their next target, Leah, Jordan's girlfriend. The reason we know where Leah is located is because on Jordan's corpse was a letter from her that says that she'll be stationed at the TV station for a bit longer than usual since there are scars in the area. Scars are what the WLF call the Seraphites, another group within the world of The Last of Us. Speaking of the groups in this game, I think Part 2 handled them quite well. I was a bit disappointed in the Fireflies from the last game, and I guess I wasn't the only one who thought about this, as both factions now play much larger roles in this game. We'll be meeting people from each group quite a bit, and majority of the enemies placed throughout the levels that aren't infected are WLF or Seraphite members, which was a smart decision, as it not only shows how much territory these groups have, but it's a nice attempt at fleshing out the world by adding more factions. The Fireflies in the first game were a fairly interesting group, but since the game focused heavily on Ellie and Joel, not much screen time was given to them outside of a few key moments. In this game, though, each faction is much more important to the story, and you won't be forgetting about them anytime soon. Such as right now, as once the two make it to the TV station, they find Leah, but they were too late, as the Seraphites got to her first. We get a few teases of the Seraphites throughout the previous gameplay sections that lead us to the station, and we can see they're a very ruthless group of people. They hang their victims right before they disembowel them. They also mark their territories with these victims, as well as paint their logo in blood. We still have yet to see an actual Seraphite, but we have seen their handiwork, and it is quite the sight. Leah being dead though means that our leads have dried up, but Leah had a lot of stuff in her duffel bag that could be helpful to their investigation. But it's also getting late, so do need to focus on finding a safe place to rest first. Before they do that though, Dina and Ellie have an interesting conversation. Well, she's dead. How do you feel? I'm pissed we couldn't talk to her. Yeah. But she didn't hurt Joel. It would have been pretty fucked up to make her talk. She traveled hundreds of miles to torture him. I don't care whether she held the club or not. I get it. Around this time, Ellie ends up falling and breaking her gas mask. Dina is naturally worried for Ellie's safety until she tells her that she's immune. Obviously this comes as quite the shock to her, but the game strangely pushes this aside by revealing something even wilder, and it's that Dina might be pregnant and that Jesse is the father. While it is rather strange that the game completely ignores how pivotal this moment is, as she hasn't revealed this to anyone outside of Tommy and Joel, I do like the contents of the reveal. Dina being pregnant will be important, as Mel, one of Abby's friends, is also pregnant, and the game is going to use both of these girls and their friends as parallels in order to convey the point it's trying to make. It's also during this time that we get introduced to one of the two new infected in part 2, the Shambler. They are similar in design to a bloater, with the main difference being that they release corrosive gas from their body, which melts the skin of anyone nearby. From what I can gather, it seems like once an infected becomes a bloater, it has a chance to mutate into a shambler instead. This may be due to Seattle's weather, as it is very rainy, and Neil Druckmann is quoted in saying that he wanted the environment and weather to have a role in the infection process. The two then make it to an abandoned theater they deem suitable to live in, which gives them enough time to discuss the elephant in the room. Dina being pregnant is a problem, as Ellie doesn't want to put another being in danger, but she also wants to kill Abby. This causes a rift in their relationship, as Ellie calls her a burden now that she's done this. Ellie decides to let things cool off between them though by letting Dina rest while she scopes out the theater. While doing so, she ends up finding a guitar and relaxes by playing some music. She ends up playing the song Future Days by Pearl Jam, which, while cool enough on its own, is the same song Joel sang for her in the prologue. I find the lyrics of the song rather interesting in hindsight, as the first two lines read, If I were to ever lose you, I would surely lose myself. This line seems to relate to both Ellie and Joel. 
If Joel were to lose Ellie, he would surely have lost himself, which is why he saves Ellie at the end of part one. And if Ellie loses Joel, then she would lose herself too. And while it's not apparent now, I can assure you she will start to lose that old side of herself throughout the course of the game. The scene then cuts to black before going to another flashback, this time three years ago, as we see Ellie and Joel on a walk together. This is the first time we've been able to see Joel since his death, and these flashbacks do provide a heartwarming feeling. If you have made it this far in the game, or even finished part one, I find it hard to believe that you don't like Joel, so seeing him happy and alive with Ellie is a great feeling. The reason the two are here is because Joel has a surprise for Ellie, and that's that they're going to be exploring an abandoned museum. Not only are there dinosaurs to explore, but on the top floor there is a space exhibit, which if you remember from part one, Ellie said one of her dreams was to be an astronaut. Joel also remembers this as he managed to find an old tape of an official launch for Ellie to listen to while she sits in one of the pods. It's incredibly adorable, and I must say that it's extremely impressive that Naughty Dog managed to keep the emotions of the player and the player character consistent no matter which part of the duo we end up playing as. In part one, we played as Joel and we grew to love Ellie alongside him. We were both happy when we found her at the end of the winter chapter, and we were both willing to lay our lives down if it meant getting Ellie out of that hospital. But in part two, we play as Ellie, and not only felt that pain and anger she felt when Joel died, but also this current feeling of happiness as we get to spend more time with Joel again. Also, and I know I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, but there's another flashback later that reinforces this idea. As the two get into a few combat encounters together, and it felt like I was playing part one again, but from Ellie's perspective. It felt great to kill infected and bandits alongside Ellie in part one, and it feels nostalgic to do it again here in part two. It's genuinely some impressive work, and Naughty Dog really deserves some credit for how well they pulled this off. Once you're done looking through the exhibit and chatting with Joel, you can continue through to another section of the museum. The two will have to split up to do so, but once they meet up, they'll see a Firefly logo with the words Liars underneath it. Judging from Ellie's reaction, you can get the sense that she doesn't fully believe what Joel told her at the end of part one, and it's something that will come up again a bit later. This scene brings us to the end of the flashback and the end of day one, and honestly, it's been quite underwhelming. There is a major contributor to this that I'll talk about a bit later, but not much has happened so far and it's been roughly 5 hours since we started our campaign. There was a few nice moments with Dina, like with the guitar and when the two explore a synagogue, but outside of that Dina and Ellie don't talk too much unless it has to do with the mission or something that's in front of them. And the game doesn't even give them the opportunity to interact with anything either since it's just back to back gameplay. Thankfully though, day 2 is a bit better. Ellie and Dina haven't talked much since last night, but it seems like both of them are okay and not mad at one another. Dina also takes it upon herself to listen in on the radio chatter coming in from the WLF. Since she's pregnant and throwing up all the time, she can't be out in the field like Ellie is, so she's trying to help out the best she can and not feel like a burden. According to Dina, someone on the comms said that there was a lone male trespasser that was spotted near Site 14, which she says might be located near a place called Hillcrest. The two assume that this trespasser is Tommy, until Ellie goes by herself to investigate and learns that it's actually Jesse. Jesse had heard that Tommy, Dina, and Ellie went off to find Abby, and obviously he wasn't going to lie down and let them handle it, which is why he made the solo trek here. Given that it's only been a couple days since we arrived in Seattle, we can assume that Jesse likely left the same day as we did and has been trying to find us ever since. Jesse then has the bright idea to steal one of the WLF's cars and drive away, but the two end up getting caught and have to now outrun more WLF soldiers and dozens of infected. It's a pretty standard chase scene, but encounters like this always get the blood pumping no matter the context. It also characterizes Jesse a bit, as we can deduce from this scene that he tends to not think things through all the time. Taking one of their cars was risky enough, especially since we almost bit it just trying to get the car started, and the explosions we saw when approaching the area were likely him too, so Jesse's kind of a reckless person. That being said though, he is still serious when he needs to be, which we'll see a bit more of in day 3. But for now, Jesse and Ellie go back to the theater and regroup with Dina. Ellie doesn't plan to stay long as Dina got a tip that Nora, one of Abby's friends, is stationed at the nearby hospital. The journey to the hospital is pretty bog standard in terms of gameplay until Ellie runs into the Seraphites. I absolutely love the introduction of the Seraphites. It starts with Ellie entering a large forested area, but once she gets in the grass, you hear someone whistle. This will immediately put you on high alert, which is why I took the long way around and crawled through the grass before I got shot with an arrow. The group also communicates through whistling, which I found to be incredibly fascinating. Basically, certain whistles mean certain things, like searching, attacking, etc. Each of the commands are consistent though, so you could in theory learn the whistles if you wanted to. By far one of their most annoying ones is their call and response whistle, where one person calls and the others whistle in response. The thing is though, is that if no one responds, then they know something happened, and then their patrol routes change, making it harder to kill them. But this is just one of the things that sets the Seraphites apart from other groups. They're a very typical religious cult that uses older technology like bows and arrows as opposed to guns as they deem its use sinful. 
although some members, mainly soldiers, are exempt from this rule, given that they're still at war with the WLF. We also know what they do to the people they kill, as we saw their creations at the TV station. It's unclear if they always take hostages or only the ones that they can spare, but it does seem like this hanging and torturing is a part of their killing process. The group deems this necessary as they believe that they are cleansing the world of sin, likely by releasing it from their guts as they hang, which is why they disembowel their victims. The group also lives on a remote island off the coast called Haven, where they all live in wood huts and longhouses. The concept of a religious cult may not be anything original compared to other media, but within The Last of Us it most certainly is. While the WLF are a cool faction, they don't have enough unique things about them that set them apart from other groups, like the Fireflies. They're just your standard, everyday militia. The Seraphites, though, are incredibly unique, and were easily my favorite faction in the game, due to how different they are from everyone in regards to both gameplay and story. Once Ellie makes it to the hospital, she ends up interrogating one of the guards for information. The girl fights back, though, and Ellie has to kill her. She ends up saying that she was dumb when she stabs her, likely referring to herself since she let the girl get a chance to strike her. Shame the girl had to die though, because if you look at what she was doing, she was in the middle of playing Hotline Miami on her PS Vita. Ellie then makes it to the upper floors of the hospital and ends up finding Nora. Nora though isn't willing to give up any info on Abby, plus she also taunts Ellie by bringing up Joel. You still hear his screams? What? I hear them every night. Yeah. Yeah, that little bitch got what he deserved. You fucking Help! Help! Her last line is pretty ironic, given she's about to get what's coming to her too, as Ellie chases her throughout the hospital, but ends up getting cornered by some WLF, as the hole behind her goes into a spore-infested room. However, since Ellie's immune, none of this bothers her, so she'll get to have some one-on-one -on -one time with Nora and take as long as she wants. Ellie ends up using a lead pipe to utterly beat Nora to death. It's definitely one of the most gruesome acts of violence we've seen so far from her since her fight with David. Now, obviously Ellie wasn't here to kill her, she just needed info on Abby. Sadly, Nora won't sell out her friend, but she does mention how Ellie can breathe the spores. Nora then puts two and two together and realizes that Ellie was that girl from the hospital, which means that Nora used to be a firefly. It's also safe to assume that Nora, Abby, and her crew all work together, meaning they're all former fireflies. I say former because Nora says that the Fireflies are all gone. They've disbanded and aren't a group anymore, at least within Seattle and Utah. It's unclear if all the Fireflies are fully gone since they are a large group, and we did see some back in Boston during the first game's prologue. That being said though, we now know why Abby and the crew hunted down Joel. They were former Fireflies and wanted Joel dead for what he did back at the hospital in part one. But as I said, that's only half the story. Ellie then comes back from the hospital and she's a mess. You can see it on her face that she's not all there mentally and she's shaking before she enters the theater. She did look quite pissed right before the screen cut to black, but not nearly as bad as this. That's because off screen, she continued to beat Nora into submission, which is how she managed to make her talk. It comes as quite the shock that she was willing to go that far, but I do think showing that scene would have gone a long way, as to me the framing of this scene implied that this was the last strike that killed Nora, not just wounding her, but maybe that's just me. Regardless, we do get to see a bit more of Ellie's body later, and she looks pretty rough. And the camera does an excellent job of showing the player how much this journey has taken a toll on her, both physically and mentally. Dina, of course, being the amazing girlfriend she is, comforts Ellie in this moment and lets her know that everything is going to be okay. Ellie's mind is all over the place here. She's conflicted on what to do, is unsure whether or not this journey is even worth it, and also what Dina thinks, among many other things. It's really just becoming too much for her. This is also what I meant when I said earlier about the roles of the characters being important, not the characters themselves, as Dina is sort of like Ellie's rock. Notice how in day one, things were quite tame when it came to killing, but now that Ellie is alone and no longer has Dina to keep her in check, she gets reckless and bashes Nora's skull in with a pipe. We can of course relate this back to our older discussion about Dina and Ellie talking about Leah and if making her talk would have been justified. Ellie sees nothing wrong with torturing her. She did travel all the way just to kill Joel, but Dina sees her as innocent since she had nothing to do with this. Dina is Ellie's voice of reason, and by not having her by her side, it means Ellie gets incredibly angry and takes things too far. In all fairness though, you might find this strange and likely agree with Ellie's actions here. They kill Joel, they deserve it. Like I said, I want to revisit this later, but think about that. Are you on Dina's side or Ellie's? As I said earlier, day two was a bit better than before. We started seeing more things take effect throughout the story, like Ellie's obsession with killing Abby, and how this rage has driven her to kill others in vicious ways, and we also get introduced to Jesse, which means we get more opportunity to see what his deal is. Things so far have been set up quite well, so let's see how they finish it with Day 3. But before we can continue, the game gives us yet another flashback. In fact, we actually got two on this day, one now and one earlier when we came back with Jesse, but I figured I would cover them both now at the same time, as they focus on the same thing. 
The first one is another one of those heartwarming moments where we get to interact with Joel before he died, but as a bonus, we get a chance to hunt some infected down with Tommy. Tommy always felt like he was put on the back burner when it came to the series, so being able to see him do more than just defend Jackson was great. He sadly doesn't show up much in Ellie's campaign, but he does have a great cameo later that I really liked. Once Ellie and Tommy finish hunting Infected, the two go back to the cabin where Joel is located. You'll notice when playing this section that something feels off. Ellie is not as talkative, and it seems like something is bothering her. That's why Tommy wanted both her and Joel to go do some patrols together so that the two can have some time to talk. This is where that nostalgia came in, as like I said, I felt like I was playing part one again but from Ellie's perspective. The two didn't do quite a few firefights with a lot of infected, and once the two survive the assault, they decide to pack it up and go home. Before leaving though, Ellie finds two skeletons on the floor. Joel mentions a bit earlier in this mission how a couple ran away from Jackson at one point, and it seems like these two bodies are that couple. The two of them left a note that talks about them wanting to leave Jackson so that they could help the people outside the walls of the city. Sadly, this didn't last long as the two got bit about an hour after leaving. To make things worse, the two were teenagers, so they had their whole lives ahead of them, only for it to be snuffed out instantly thanks to the cordyceps. This once again brings us back to Ellie's survivor guilt, as they died from the infection, yet she's still alive. Thanks to this discovery though, the topic of discussion is once again brought up. Is now really the time for this? We traveled across the entire country to bring me to the Fireflies. I had so many questions for them. Why did you pull me out of there while I was still unconscious? Because I let them run their tests. And when I saw that they were useless, I got us out of there. How do you know they were useless? Maybe if you, you just would have given them more time, they could have figured Ellie. something out. There was no cure. Ellie is clearly pissed off, and even though she drops the conversation, you can tell she's not satisfied. Which takes us to our next flashback, where we see Ellie visit the same hospital where it all went down so she can find some answers for herself. Ellie ends up finding a recording that talks about how they escaped and that their chances of a vaccine are gone, but not because the two left, but because Joel killed the only doctor that could have made it happen. Joel then arrives on horseback, and Ellie brings up the conversation again before the final time. Making a vaccine. Would have killed you. So I stopped them. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't you fucking touch me. I'll go back. But we're done. Ellie finally learns the truth about what happened that night. She has been dealing with survivor's guilt since she was bit five years ago, and hearing that she actually had the chance to die and make her life mean something, only for it to be taken away, tears her apart. Going back to our earlier conversation at the end of part one, regarding whether or not Ellie would have gone through with the surgery if she knew she would have died, I think it's safe to assume that she would have, or else she would have thanked Joel for saving her. Furthermore, this connects to the first conversation we have with Jesse regarding why Ellie was mad at Joel for standing up for her. It's not that she was mad at Joel for what he did to Seth, but it's just that he was mad at him in general and didn't want him in her life, as she finds it incredibly hard to forgive him after what he did. I think my only gripe with this scene is its placement. This happened in-universe two years ago, meaning this Ellie we've been playing as the whole time knew about what happened. My first reaction to this scene wasn't, oh, here we go, now she knows. It was, wait a minute, so she's known the whole time I've been playing as her? I thought for long stretches of time that Joel died with that secret, and I was wondering how Ellie was going to learn of this herself if she ever would, then come to find out she already knew. While I like the contents of the flashbacks themselves, their placements are just bizarre. In all honesty, the whole thing as a concept is bizarre. I know that making all this chronological would slow the pace of the game down since it officially starts once Joel dies, but still, its inclusion is very strange to me. With that though, we have come to day three, and Jesse and Ellie have a talk regarding Dina. 
Jessie learns that she's pregnant and says that they need to go back to Jackson so that she can get the care she needs. Ellie agrees, but is of course very reluctant to do so since she came here to get revenge and doesn't want to leave empty-handed, especially since we've already killed some of her friends already. Furthermore, Ellie also doesn't want to leave Tommy behind since he's still doing his thing out there, so the plan is to get Tommy and then find a way back to Jackson. To do that though, they plan to go to the aquarium and hold out there until they find his location. On the way to the aquarium, Jesse brings up a few good points. He asks Ellie if she's okay with leaving some of Abby's crew behind. She says that it's okay because Dina needs to be back in Jackson. Jesse then asks if she thinks they'll come back to Jackson. They might want to get revenge for what Ellie did, but she responds by saying that she only came here because of what Abby did. But Jesse claps back and says that they only came to Jackson because of what Joel did. It's a bit confusing, but Jesse is trying to tell not only Ellie but the player that maybe this trip isn't worth the trouble and that this cycle of revenge isn't going to go away. The trip to the aquarium is quite long, but thankfully the two find a boat which will allow them to travel through the flood. But right before they entered the mall, the two heard some chatter about a sniper who they assume is Tommy. Jesse wants to go save Tommy before he's killed, but Ellie wants to go to the aquarium as Abby could be there. You start to see how this revenge trip is causing Ellie to distance herself away from her friends. She called Dina a burden earlier and now refuses to help Tommy and Jesse if it means going after Abby. Once the two split up because they couldn't find a compromise, Ellie then grabs the boat and makes it to the aquarium, but instead of finding Abby, she finds Owen and Mel. Abby is not here though, and the two refuse to give up her position. Both of them are worried that she'll kill them anyway even if they did, but Ellie says that they can survive if they just do what she says. Just like the brothers, Ellie also uses their interrogation tactic by having Mel point to where she is on the map and then having Owen confirm it. This doesn't work though, as Owen attempts to disarm Ellie and then gets promptly shot in the stomach, which is then followed by Mel's own death thanks to Ellie stabbing her in the throat. This is where the gore of the game really started to hit me. Part 2 can be pretty gruesome at times, and these deaths were really where it started to set in. As stated before, Part 2 was quite divisive amongst fans, and a major complaint I saw was that the game was supposed to show you that violence is bad, yet never gives you a chance to stop that violence. While I agree to some extent, I also want to offer a counter-argument that you might want to consider. The game is trying to show you that the violence and death Ellie is committing are bad, but it's only supposed to stop at her. This is a problem because games are not only artificial, but it's also an interactive medium, so our actions are Ellie's actions. But we're supposed to be the player and spectator of this game, and that's tough to do when we play through the whole thing ourselves. Part 2 is trying to show us that Ellie's actions are terrible and unnecessary. Even though we are the ones to actually act out these actions, we're still supposed to be mad at Ellie for doing this. She is the one putting us in this position in the first place, as she's the one that keeps going out to search for Abby. Essentially, she's holding the gun for us and telling us to pull the trigger. This would connect to the game's message, as if we were able to spare these people, then the whole story is lost. Ellie's journey is fueled by hatred and revenge, which is why her violence is becoming more unhinged. She doesn't care what happens to Abby's friends, and these no-name soldiers not only have orders to shoot trespassers, which she is, but they're also preventing her from reaching her objective. If Ellie was able to spare these people, but the events of the game still played out normally, then it would be too drastic of a change to see her be a pacifist one minute, then bludgeon or the next. This journey is supposed to be one of violence, anger, and hatred, and we're supposed to be disappointed in Ellie for not only doing this, but also putting us in a situation where we have to do it too. The following reveal also reinforces the point that we should be disappointed in her for what she did, as it's revealed that Mel was pregnant. This causes her to have a panic attack now that she's come to terms of what she just did. Thankfully, Tommy and Jesse show up just in time to save her, though. Oddly enough, if you listen closely, it kind of sounds like Joel is calling out to her instead of Tommy. I wonder if it's her mind thinking it's Joel because she wants him to come save her like he did back during the winter. Really goes to show how much she still cares for him even after what he did. Thanks to Owen, though, they're out of leads. Not like that was the plan anyway, since they were just here to get Tommy and then go back to Jackson. It was only during their argument with Jesse where she decided to go find Abby on her own. Back at the theater though, Jesse, Tommy, and Ellie talk about how to get back while Dina sleeps. The problem though is that Ellie dropped her map and never picked it back up at the aquarium as she was still too deep in her panic attack to notice. Shit. Jesse, stand up. Hands in the air, I shoot this one too. Don't you do it, Ellie. Get out of here! Stand up! Now! Don't you fucking dare! Shut the fuck up! Oh. Fuck. All right. Stop! Stop! Once again, this further confirms that blazes of glory do not exist in the world of The Last of Us, and Jesse was not an exception. Before we can even come to terms of what just happened, we get another flashback, but this time from Abby's perspective. This takes place five years ago, and from this flashback, we learn why Abby killed Joel. Yes, she is a firefly, but she has a personal stake in this quest for revenge, because the doctor Joel killed was her dad. 
Jerry Anderson was his name and Abby was his daughter. That's why she came to Jackson, so Joel could pay for murdering her dad. Things are starting to make much more sense now. Naturally, this is around the time we come back to the present and see how things unfold, right? We're at the final few minutes of the game and we're ready to see how it ends. Wrong. We have just reached the halfway point of part two, as right after this, Abby awakes from a dream and the title card says Seattle Day 1, meaning we have to go through the same three days again as Abby. This is why a lot of people were disappointed with this game. It is a lot to ask a player to do, probably the most I've ever been asked in my life. Not only did Joel die, but now we're forced to play as his killer, and not for a short time, might I add. Which brings me to my least favorite part about this game, it's pacing. Part 2, when it comes to its length and order of events, is just bad. The thing is, though, is that there's no other way to fix this that doesn't require rewriting the whole thing. Chronological order doesn't work, as we've already discussed, but flip-flopping between both of them each day won't work either. And by flip-flopping, I mean that they employ what they did during the winter chapter in Part 1, but for all of Part 2. So we would do Ellie's Day 1, then Abby's Day 1, and then back and forth until they meet at the theater. The problem is that the reason that was so successful in Part 1 was because it was short and narratively it made sense. The whole chapter is no longer than an hour or two, so going back and forth like that won't disrupt much of the gameplay. Plus, Ellie was a side character, at least for the purposes of gameplay, as she had no upgrade tree like Joel, and most enemies dropped ammo so that you could keep fighting. Unlike Joel, where enemies didn't drop anything at all sometimes. They did that so that the player didn't have to get bogged down by the gameplay during Ellie's section since they already have to manage ammo and supplies as Joel. Doing that with Ellie and Abby makes no sense since they have completely different inventories, weapons, and upgrades. It would just disrupt the flow of the gameplay if we switched off at the end of each day. More importantly though, it narratively doesn't make sense either, since we're going to have to wait the same amount of time to reach this climax anyway, the current way is just teasing us first, but that tension that chapter provided is not present in this game. Ellie and Joel in that chapter were minutes apart, and it felt like we were just on our heels, but we needed to go faster if we had any chance of catching her. That doesn't work in part 2, as Abby and Ellie never meet. Hell, Abby has no idea she's even being hunted by Ellie until this moment. The closest these two get is the hospital and the aquarium, where Abby goes to the hospital to meet Nora, and then hours later Ellie comes by and kills her. And for the aquarium, Ellie comes and kills Mel and Owen, and then Abby presumably arrives a few hours later. This isn't one of those cliches where our two protagonists are just a block away, or Ellie's hiding from a group of WLF members and then come to find out Abby was in that group and they just missed each other. They are literally miles apart for 90% of the game, so this method wouldn't work, it would just make the pacing even worse. The only way to fix this is to just simply reduce the runtime. So far, I've written about 13 pages on part 2, and assuming my math is correct, we've been roughly talking about this part for 50 minutes, but you don't even know the half of it. This so far has been 12 hours of gameplay, and we have another 10 to go before we can get back to this scene. So much of this game is just back-to-back -back combat encounters. When I do these videos, I usually have the recordings on my second monitor so I can go back and watch it while I write. Multiple times, I scrub through hours of footage just to get to the next part since all of it was gameplay. For example, in this video, we went from Jordan to Leah right away, but that was separated by an hour and 30 minutes of gameplay during my playthrough, and then I had to wait another hour before we got to the theater. I summarized that section in just a few minutes, but it took over two hours just to play. As much as I love the gameplay in this game, I feel like some of these long stretches of combat could have been cut down a bit. For further context, Part 1 took about 12 hours for me to beat, which was about as long as Ellie's campaign alone. Part 2 is basically double the length of Part 1. As always though, there is a massive caveat to all of this, as pacing is extremely subjective. Game length is a weird thing to discuss since there's no definitive number, because it's all based on the feelings of the player, and some people have different tolerances for this stuff. I found Assassin's Creed Valhalla to be way too damn long, but I played Elden Ring for even longer and found its length adequate. The numbers and feelings are never going to be consistent, which is why it needs to be judged on its own, and in my eyes, Part 2 felt like it was dragging on far too long. But if you disagree, I'd love to hear why. As for the real elephant in the room, that of course being Abby's campaign, you'll already know that I didn't mind this at all. In fact, I feel like without it, the game wouldn't be as complete. Firstly, ignoring whose campaign it is, I'm just glad we got something at all, because if the game was truly going to end at this theater, it would probably be even worse than its reception is now, because realistically, what have we done so far? Story-wise, all Ellie has done is kill four of Abby's friends and that's it. Nothing has actually happened. Our objective hasn't even been complete yet since we haven't even met Abby until now. Nothing was learned, nothing was gained, and we didn't even get to hear much about Dina and Jesse. It would honestly be a pretty pathetic game if it was just Ellie's campaign. But while some may agree with that take, they may also think that Abby's campaign was not a good substitute for it. But I massively disagree. 
Furthermore, I heard many people say that Abby's campaign was placed here so that you could feel sympathy for her, and that the main theme of the game is a poor attempt at saying revenge is bad, but I also have to disagree with that. Personally, I don't feel sympathy for Abby at all. I think if Ellie killed her, it would be totally justified. The thing is, though, is that it's not going to solve anything. Abby and Ellie are two sides of the same coin, two girls whose fathers died by someone for some unknown reason. Abby's campaign is going to show us how she got over the grief of losing her dad so that we the player can hope that Ellie does the same. If it worked for Abby, it has to work for her too, because ultimately that's what all of us really want at the end of the day. We just want Ellie to feel better and to be that happy kid we remember from part 1, not the grief-stricken murderer of part 2, and Abby's campaign is going to show how that's possible, by giving us a chance to see someone else go through the same thing. Abby's first day in Seattle starts at the WLF base, with her being awoken by Manny. For context, Manny was the one who spit on Joel after Abby killed him. We'll also end up meeting Jordan, Mel, and Alice, all of whom we are familiar with except for Alice, who is the group's guard dog. She, like the others, is also dead because right before Ellie met Owen and Mel at the aquarium, she fell through a vent in the ceiling and had to put Alice down. It is definitely a strange feeling seeing all these people happy, just knowing that in a couple days they'll all be dead. As for the base itself, the WLF have settled into a nearby stadium and they seem to be doing well for themselves. It's hard to compare Jackson to the WLF base since we don't get an opportunity to walk around the town, but it does seem like the WLF have a lot more resources than they do. Especially since Jackson was mainly meant to be a town with civilians where the WLF base has soldiers in it. This also isn't their only base, as Abby's job for the day is to run some patrols and eventually make it to one of their FOBs. Joining her on this expedition will be Manny, Alice, and Mel. It's definitely strange that Mel is coming along since she is very clearly pregnant, but this is supposed to be a routine patrol, so it should be safe for her to come along as they aren't expecting combat. Which means we're going to be expecting combat. The Seraphites ambush the truck and we have to fend them off. Before the chaos ensues though, Abby and Mel talk for a bit and you start to get the sense that they aren't on good terms, and this is likely due to Owen. We'll cover the flashbacks that show this info later, but Abby and Owen used to date before Owen moved on to Mel. But as we'll soon see, their feelings haven't wavered and this causes some issues for this trio. That's why Mel mentions Owen's name when they talk about picking up more assignments, since Mel probably assumes that Abby's picking up more shifts so that she could be with Owen. During this conversation, Mel also asks Abby how she's been sleeping these days. Despite the fact that she's finally taken down her father's killer, she said that her sleeping is still as bad as it's been before. Abby doesn't seem to be the only one who was affected by that night, as some of her friends are either traumatized and or regret doing it in the first place. Slowly but surely, the idea starts to trickle in that none of them were too happy with what happened that day. Abby is the one that was affected the least by this, but that's still just as concerning, since this act was supposed to heal her and allow her to get closure, yet nothing happened. After the group clears out the Seraphites, they'll eventually reach the base, before they get some bad news. Apparently their friend Danny died recently. Even more worrying is that Owen was with him and they haven't heard from him since. Manny and Abby then go and find Isaac to see what's up, but he's currently busy torturing a Seraphite they have locked up at the base. Isaac is a ruthless leader, and he seems to be taking things a bit too far at points, but that's due to his history with the Seraphites. The WLF have been at war with the Seraphites for quite some time. The WLF took over Fedra, the military, and were considered the biggest threat in Seattle, until the Seraphites came in and started encroaching on their land. The Seraphites were led by a woman named the Prophet, and her and the WLF exchanged blows on several occasions. At one point, a truce was made with the hope that they could stop the fighting, but it was eventually broken only a short time after its inception. This led to dozens of skirmishes and battles, one of which resulted in the WLF capturing the Prophet herself. Isaac personally handed her interrogation, and after growing weary about the current state of the war, opted to have her executed. This threw the cult into a frenzy and resulted in them taking over the land where she was executed, which is now known as Martyr's Gate. Isaac had hoped that killing their leader would have stopped the war, but it's only made it worse, which is why he's currently planning a strategy for the final battle, which involves them burning down Haven, ending the war for good. As I said earlier, the lore of these factions runs deep, and I'm so glad that the factions of the world got more attention this time around, as it makes them feel like genuine parts of the world, and not just names on a lore document. The Seraphites are an incredibly unique faction for the way they communicate to even how they were formed, and the WLF, while not anything groundbreaking, is at least expanded upon, which makes the war between these factions feel important. This war that Isaac is planning is also important though, as Abby is going to be on the front lines. Abby is very well known amongst the WLF. She's considered Isaac's best soldier and arguably the best Seraphite killer in the entire faction. She's killed hundreds if not thousands of Seraphites on her own and has personally interrogated just as many. She's ruthless and efficient, and I think a lot of this is because of what happened to her father. In the past five years since her father died, Abby's gained quite a bit of muscle mass, so it's safe to assume that this event hardened her and killing Seraphites was sort of a way for her to de-stress. Sadly, Isaac's plan is going to have some holes in it thanks to Abby going AWOL in the next few minutes. This is because Isaac tells her how Danny died, 
which prompts Abby to seek out and search for Owen. That's because it's learned that Owen was the one who killed Danny. It may seem odd for Abby of all people to disobey Isaac, but I never got the idea that Abby was actually loyal to him. Abby and her crew, who Isaac calls the Salt Lake crew, were all former Fireflies, and Isaac took them in out of the kindness of his heart. But the WLF are not their friends. They may respect these people, but they don't converse with them casually outside of missions. While they will help the WLF, if the going gets tough, they only look out for each other, and right now, one of their own might be in trouble. Abby is also quite positive that she knows where Owen is, and that's the aquarium. Multiple flashbacks will confirm this, as Owen seems to be making this place his home. While on the way to the aquarium, Abby gets caught by some seraphites and is knocked out. She then awakes next to a few other seraphites while they drag her to their hanging post. Abby's about to be one of those bodies we found at the TV station, but is saved thanks to one of their members finding someone called Yara. Shortly after, another person arrives named Lev. Both Lev and Yara are former seraphites who left the cult for an unknown reason, at least for now. Lev then cuts Abby down thanks to her helping them, which prevents her from dying. The three aren't out of the woods yet, pun intended, as there are stalkers that roam this forest, and the trio has to go through waves of infected before making it to safety. I will say though, there is something incredibly satisfying about watching this hulking beast of a woman curb stomp infected into the ground like it's nothing. Despite the fact that they are seraphites, Abby works with them anyway. This isn't wildly out of character for her, as like I said, Abby seems to place her loyalty in people she trusts, and Yara and Lev are not only being hunted by the same people as Abby, but they also helped her full well knowing that she was a WLF soldier. I must say, I'm also quite surprised that the game didn't attempt to shoehorn them in just yet, as once they make it to a safe spot, Abby helps Yara with her arm, and then leaves. She had no intention of actually staying with them, but she figured as payment for saving her, she should at least make sure they're safe. Usually some games would come up with some unrealistic reason for why they stick together since the developers want them to be together as soon as possible. This could be quite common in many RPGs that have multiple companions, as each one needs a reason to join, and sometimes that reason makes no sense. Now obviously Naughty Dog isn't that bold enough to just introduce two new characters and then have them never appear again, so even though Abby leaves them alone for now, she will eventually come back and meet them, but I found her reasoning for doing so to not be that outlandish. That reason in question comes from a nightmare she has at the aquarium. When she arrives at said aquarium, she'll meet with Owen who is sitting in a boat. Abby will talk with Owen before asking if what Isaac said is true. Owen confirms that he did indeed shoot Danny. When out on patrol, both him and Danny were fighting some seraphites, one of whom was this older man. Owen hit him really hard on the head, but instead of the man reaching for his gun, he just sat there. The man was clearly tired of the war and didn't want to fight anymore. Owen says that he's killed a lot of scars in his time, but this one really got to him, which is why he didn't kill him. Danny was going to finish him off for him, which is why Owen retaliated by putting a bullet in his chest. Abby clearly cares about Owen, so she tries to come up with some sort of plan to fix this, but Owen doesn't care. He's just sick of all the fighting. In fact, Owen wants to leave Seattle and go to Santa Barbara. Apparently, he heard that the Fireflies were attempting to rebuild there, and he wants to go see if it's true. Abby scoffs at this, not only calling him insane, but also saying that he needs to grow up. That's when Owen gets on her case about her killing Joel, saying, How do I grow up, Abby? Do I go find the people that killed my family and make them pay for what they did? This leads into a physical altercation before things get even more physical, but in a more passionate way. As shocking as this is, once again, it's not as wild as it seems, as just like Ellie's campaign, we also get a couple flashbacks during this day, all of which revolve around Owen. The flashbacks do a pretty good job of showing the characters' actions and emotions before this moment, which overall helps the scene make more narrative sense. For example, you can tell that Owen for years has always been hesitant to place his loyalties in the factions he's a part of, and is also able to recognize that they have all done some bad things. I just don't understand how anybody willingly joins the Scars. Why not? Because they're an insane cult, that's why. Well, in the QZs, people would refer to the Fireflies as terrorists. Fanatics. We were naive. We weren't fanatical. We blew up checkpoints and assassinated soldiers. It's not the same. I'm just saying... Don't say shit like that at the stadium, okay? Okay, all right. You defended yourself. Stop. I can fix this. I'll talk to Isaac. I am tired, Abby. I don't want to fight over land that I don't give a fuck about anymore. Furthermore, the flashbacks also show how deep their love is for each other. As in our first flashback, which takes place three years ago, Owen and Abby are currently exploring the aquarium, but for the first time. The two end up sharing a kiss at the end before Abby backs away. She cares about Owen, but this thing with Joel is driving a wedge between them, as it's all she can think about. The same thing happens in the next flashback, which is four months ago, and roughly right before they all leave to go to Jackson. Abby comes over to the aquarium, and we can see that Owen has added some decorations and really made the place his own. Mel also seems to have taken residence here, which causes some problems for these two. At this point in the timeline, Abby and Mel are still not on good terms, thanks to Abby still showing interest in Owen even after they broke up. The problem is that they never officially broke up. 
Abby's quest for vengeance created some distance between the two, but it's clear that the feelings are still there. Both of them clearly like each other, but it's more awkward now since Owen has moved on and is also going to be a father. Like I said, those feelings they have still remain, but despite the fact that she just slept with someone she loved for a long time, in both definitions of the word as she actually sleeps over at the aquarium, she's still having nightmares. This one in particular being unique as instead of opening the door to the operating room and seeing her dad again, she sees Yara and Lev hanging. This is what causes Abby to find them again and make sure they're okay. This has been widely criticized as being shoehorned in, as it makes no sense why she would help these two even though she just met them, but I found this to be quite the opposite. Abby's been dealing with a lot of guilt since Joel's death. I don't think she feels guilty about killing him, but those nightmares haven't gone away. She only did this to get closure, but as we know, nothing's changed. Moreover, these two kids haven't wronged her in any way. Even though they knew she was a WLF soldier, they still cut her down, and Abby recognized that helpful deed, which is why she cares about them. And having them die to the Seraphites would really put an effect on her conscience, as she had the opportunity to help them, but never did. It may also be that Owen's words are rubbing off on her. She clearly cares about Owen enough to hear him out, so it's possible that hearing the story about Owen and the old man caused her to think about Yara and Lev. If we want to go even further, although this is admittedly a bit of a stretch, we could even say that Yara and Lev for Abby and the old man for Owen reminded them both of Joel. The old man was struck over the head by Owen, similar to Joel, and I'm wondering if seeing that old man on the ground in pain reminded him of that day. For Abby, both Lev and Yara, despite being on opposing sides, still help Abby, just like how Joel helped her during the snowstorm. Now, the circumstances of that are much different, as Joel wasn't at war with them, but still, it shows that Joel is a caring man and not the monster she likely made him out to be. Just like how Yara and Lev are Seraphites, yet they don't fit with Abby's description of what a Seraphite is to her. Like I said, the last one might be a bit of a stretch, but the other examples definitely show how much Yara and Lev impacted her in their short time together. That's why once she wakes up the following morning, she goes looking for them with the hope that they haven't died yet. Abby manages to get there just in time and take Yara back to the aquarium so that Mel can perform surgery on her. Sadly, the bone is shattered and she's contracted compartment syndrome, meaning the only solution is to cut it off. Furthermore, Mel has no medical equipment, so she couldn't perform the procedure even if she wanted to. But both Abby and Lev agree to go out and find the supplies together. Abby and Lev's dynamic throughout this section is sort of like Joel and Ellie's, although admittedly not as interesting as them, as remember, it's the roles of the characters that matter, not the personalities. Now, that doesn't mean Lev isn't likable, but Part 1's whole story was about their relationship, whereas in Part 2, this is just a small piece, so it's only natural that Part 1 dominates in that department. I do also want to clarify something, I'm not defending the game's decision to do this. I actually hate it, as it makes it harder to connect with these characters. I'm only repeating this statement because it's important to understanding the story. Just because it's important though, doesn't mean you have to like it, and I personally don't. As Yara, Lev, Owen, and Mel kinda just became Jesse and Dina. Owen and Mel do have a bit more going on for them as we've already discussed, but Yara and Lev felt underdeveloped to me. Yara is just like Jesse in that she only shows up for a few minutes across the entire campaign and doesn't really have enough going for her for me to consider her interesting. Lev has a bit more going on and is likable enough just like Dina, but I do wish there was more one-on-one -on -one moments between them, as just like with Ellie and Dina, they are very few and far between. One of those moments, though, is about to come up once the two enter this extremely tall building. Lev and the other Seraphites use these bridges to go past the WLF. The problem is that these bridges are very high and Abby's afraid of heights. I really like how this was showcased in-game as opposed to just saying it, as when you look over a ledge, the camera pans back a bit and Abby's face becomes more frightened, whereas with Ellie, none of this occurs. Personally, as someone who also has a fear of heights, I love how well this was added. The smaller details, like her trying to grab onto anything so that she can feel stable, in combination with her slow movements because she doesn't want to rush through it all and fall, are very realistic and very well done. Now, Abby is a much better person than me, though, as I would have scooted across this one part instead of crouching, but to be fair, if she doesn't do this, Yara will die. She's willing to brave through the tight walk across the crane and essentially conquer her fears if it means getting those supplies, which just goes to show you how much she really cares about these two. Abby does end up slipping at the end, though, but luckily falls through the roof and into a pool. She's alive, thankfully, but this fall has caused a bit of a problem as the bridge was designed to take them to the other side of the building. But since they fell, they'll have to take a different route a route that just happens to be littered with all kinds of infected, from clickers to bloaters. The visual design of this section was top-notch, and definitely up there as one of my favorites in Part 2. It's basically a giant building that's crumbling from the inside. The floors don't connect, cordyceps spores are everywhere, and the only way to traverse is to go down. It's something that was desperately missing from this game, as most of our journey has taken place outside, and while those environments did look good, I did miss the thrill of going straight through a nest of infected, always wondering what wall they were going to come out of next. The building's exit just happens to be right next to the hospital, which is very convenient, but this hospital may seem familiar as it's the same one we just went through as Ellie. This should be good for Abby since we know that the WLF are stationed here, but she's still considered AWOL and can't just waltz right in. 
Abby also has to leave Lev behind for the time being as he's still dressed like a Seraphite. I really like the decision to make Abby do this solo because it further intensifies the fight that's about to happen, as this hospital is ground zero for the entire infection. Some of the earliest cases of cordyceps, at least within the state, originated here, and that infection started 25 years ago, an infection that gets worse with time. This is our final infected, and easily the biggest one we've seen all series, called the Rat King. Strangely enough, this is not a new infected, but rather multiple infected turned into one large monster. The mechanics for the fight are also connected to this, as defeating it doesn't mean just shooting it until it dies, as at one point it becomes too weak to hold the infected together, causing some to split off and attack you alongside the Rat King. It seems like all manner of infected are a part of this thing, making this a terrifying beast to go up against. The fight is incredibly difficult as well, which makes sense given how big it is. I must have died at least five times trying to kill this thing. It one-shots you pretty much every time you fight it, and eats those dollar store-ass bullets we have like it's nothing. There isn't an in-game reason as to how the Rat King exists to my knowledge, but it's safe to assume that the cordyceps that grew from the various infected down here eventually connected, causing it to take a different form. This would not only require a lot of infected, but a lot of time, which is why we've only found one of these things so far, and it's located here at Ground Zero. Defeating the Rat King, though, does give Abby the chance to find the medical supplies in peace, and once she goes outside, rendezvous with Lev and makes her way back to the aquarium with the supplies in hand, we finish Day 2. Overall, the first two days of Abby's campaign were pretty okay. I think Day 2 was much better than Day 1, as the first day focused on getting us familiar with people who are already dead, and then spent the rest of that time forcing us into combat. Day 2 is really where the story starts to take off, as the focus is centered on Lev and Abby. Naughty Dog really needed to make sure the first day was great, as it's already starting off on the wrong foot by making us play as Abby. But nothing of importance happens that day, minus the interactions with Yar and Lev at the end of the chapter, three hours in. It needed to blow people out of the water from the get-go, but all it did was make a small splash. If you are willing to put up with it though, the second day will help take some of that distaste and disgust you may have for the story off your shoulders. For me, I was already invested despite the slow start, because I wanted to see where Naughty Dog was going with this campaign, because they clearly had something planned. This isn't just something you throw together in a couple months. Abby's campaign was likely a part of the first draft, so it's clear that they built the game around this idea, so I was willing to play fetch with them if it meant that I got that treat afterwards. As always though, my main issue is still the length. I think Abby's campaign may have gone over a lot better with fans if the length wasn't as long as the previous campaign. Ellie is a fine character to have a lengthy campaign for, same with Joel. I mean, I already played as Joel for 12 hours and that didn't bother me. And playing as Ellie wouldn't have bothered me either, but it's due to Part 2 not filling in that time with anything outside of repetitive gameplay encounters that caused me to lose interest. Abby's campaign doesn't change the mold despite the fact that it needed to, and I think forcing the player to play just as long as Ellie with similar repetition was a slap in the face. After this is Seattle Day 3, arguably the most important day for Abby as the growth she shows throughout this day is rather impressive. And Naughty Dog does this once again by using subtlety. At the beginning of the day, Lev calls Abby Wolf, as that's a nickname the WLF have, but now he starts to call her Abby. It shows that he's starting to slowly trust her, plus their journey together allowed the two to work as a team and trust each other even more. Abby also lets Lev become acquainted with Alice, which helps Lev conquer his fears. Lev is terrified of dogs, likely because the only dogs the Seraphites have ever seen are the bloodthirsty hounds of the WLF. So it's only natural that he would be scared of them, but as an act of kindness and also because Lev helped her conquer her fears, Abby lets Lev pet Alice so that he can overcome his own. You'll also notice by now how much Abby's attitude has changed when around Lev. She's really taking a liking to him and Yara as they've really changed her perspective on life. Lev will ask Abby at one point why she's doing this, a question many players likely had themselves, to which she says that she needed to lighten the load. She's mentally exhausted, and her mind is filled with guilt, rage, revenge, and other harmful thoughts. Helping Levin Yara, though, will remove some of those thoughts, allowing it to be filled with more pleasant feelings. Mel, though, like some players, though, is probably not buying this act of chivalry that Abby's been doing. Actually, I'm going with them. But not if you come. What? He may fall for your little act with these kids, but I don't. There's nothing to fall for. Isaac's top scar killer suddenly had a change of heart. Nothing to do with Owen. Right. I haven't always done the right thing. You're a piece of shit, Abby. You always have been. Mel is very insecure about her relationship with Owen, but it's hard to blame her since him and Abby did just have sex the day prior. She clearly likes Owen, I mean she's pregnant with their kid after all, but she also knows that Abby and Owen still have feelings for each other. 
That's why all of this is just a charade, an attempt to make her look like a good person in the eyes of Owen so she can win him over again. Think about the beginning of the campaign. Abby talks about picking up more shifts to keep her mind off things, which is what Owen was doing. She also goes AWOL in an attempt to find Owen once he goes AWOL, and now she's trying to help out a few Seraphites around the time Owen told her about the man that he couldn't kill. If we want to go even further, it seems like Owen's been losing feelings for Mel. As once Abby and Owen meet again, they talk about Santa Barbara, but Abby declines, saying that she can't go because Mel doesn't want her coming along. Owen responds to that by saying that all of this is just a mess and that they should be allowed to be happy, implying that he wants to be happy with Abby. That's why she doesn't believe any of this, and thinks Abby will always be the top scar killer and nothing more. We know the real truth though, and the game confirms this because Abby has another dream, but instead of seeing the same scene over again, she for the first time in probably years, sees her dad standing there, smiling. This is the most important scene in the game. It's the first dream she's had that had a happy ending, which shows us and her that she's able to overcome this grief and revenge by putting her time and energy into something else besides that revenge. Abby helping Lev and Yara had the byproduct of also helping herself, and that is the point of her entire campaign. It's to show us how Abby succeeds in overcoming her issues and how Ellie can do the same. Ellie is currently on the same train as Abby, but she needs to get off at the next stop or she's going to be just like Abby. This is why I said that the second half of the game makes part 2 so great, as without this, the game has no message or story. Playing as Abby for a long time was starting to become a drag, and we still have about 4 more hours to go before it's over, but I am happy that I went through with it, because you come out of this campaign with a whole new perspective, and it's a shame a lot of people gave up before the finish line, even if part of it wasn't really their fault given the game's length, because Abby's story is incredibly important, as now it's starting to get interesting. Once Abby wakes up and gets into an argument with Mel, Yara comes by to talk to her. Yara knows that Abby's doing all of this because she cares, not because she's trying to impress Owen. She also wants to go to Santa Barbara with Owen and Mel, but Lev refuses. This is because the two left their mother back at Haven, and Lev wants her to come with them, but that might not be possible. Very early on in the campaign, we are told that the two were considered apostates by the Seraphites because Lev cut his hair. This is obviously a very strange thing to be mad about, so either the Seraphites really are that crazy, or something else is going on here. As you would expect, it's the latter. See, Lev is not actually Lev. Lev is a boy, but he was born a girl named Lily, meaning Lev is trans. The reason he shaved his head is because by faction rules, Lev was supposed to be a housewife for one of the elders. That is more than enough reason to leave, as Lev is like 13 at best, but it just so happens that this act of shaving his head also helped with his ongoing issue, which was his gender identity. This could also be why Lev is so particular about names. When Abby and him go to the hospital alone, Abby constantly says the word scars in reference to the Seraphites. Lev will correct her each time she does this to a point where Abby corrects herself without Lev's assistance. Scar is a term used to vilify the Seraphites, whereas Seraphite is their actual name. Given that Lev has a different name than the one he was given at birth, it's possible that this is the reason why he's very adamant about using the proper name for things. As for this reveal, I liked the way it was handled, as it felt natural. The game was never in your face about these details, and I felt like it was handled quite well. I know quite a few people had an issue with a trans character being in the game, but I don't see the problem with it. Getting back on track, once they realize Lev left for the island, Abby and Yara chase after him. The plan is to get a boat from the marina and take it to the island. Once they make it near the dock though, sniper shots can be heard, so Abby continues on alone. Apparently this sniper is a lot closer than I thought, as when Abby walks onto the road, she almost gets her head taken off if not for Manny jumping in to save her. Manny is here because Isaac and the WLF plan to hit the island tonight, which of course was the plan he told us a few days ago, but to do that they need the boats, the same ones we're trying to get. Abby doesn't tell Manny why she needs one, but he trusts her enough not to ask, but to get there, they're gonna have to take out the sniper anyway. This is very similar to the sniper sequence from the last game, but it's much longer in both length and width, and there's some new additions, like a ton of infected polluting the path, meaning we'll have to kill the infected while also keeping our heads down. I've always liked when developers repurpose old encounters like this, as they have much more knowledge on how to handle it this time around. Part 2 pretty much took what was great about the original and expands on it. The only thing they didn't add is the ability to kill the sniper early. This bothered me in the last game since you could very easily line up a shot if you were careful, and it's even more of an annoyance here in part 2 as there are numerous times you can kill the sniper only for the game to basically cheat you out of a kill. Like in this example where I got one shot when I got too close, despite the fact that the bullets don't do nearly as much damage as this. Now I know why this stuff exists, especially here in part 2, because the devs clearly have something planned and don't want it to be skipped because we took an alternative approach to the encounter, but I still think it would have been cool to have. Now to be fair, this would have only worked in part 1, because the sniper in part 2 is Tommy, and killing him now would break the continuity of the story. So as I said, I can understand why we can't kill him now. Plus, killing him early would mean we get to miss the most surprising death of the game, as Tommy domes Manny while the two are pushing a door open. Abby has no time to reminisce though and has to push on until she and Tommy exchange blows before Yara comes by and saves her. 
This harkens back to one of my earlier comments about Tommy having a much more prominent role in this game, which I appreciated, as he's really causing trouble for the WLF here and he's doing it all on his own. I remember going through this encounter and thinking, who is this guy, before I got closer and realized, wait a minute, that's Tommy. Now I kind of spoiled it for myself when I went the wrong way and he put a sniper around through my chest, but you may have also caught on to this yourself, as in that flashback with Tommy, he teaches Ellie to shoot at certain objects since the infected are attracted to noise, which is how Tommy lured the infected to us in the parking garage. It was an absolutely brilliant callback to that scene, it really shows how much attention to detail Naughty Dog puts into their games. Once Abby throws Tommy off the pier, her and Yara take a boat to the island, and we can see that the war is starting to begin. Minus a few important cutscenes, this whole section is just an hour and a half of straight gameplay, but it was actually one of the few times I didn't mind it, as the sheer spectacle of this whole area as the fire engulfs the huts and longhouses, while each side battles each other to finally settle the dispute once and for all, was extremely captivating. I just couldn't help but feel awestruck every time I passed through a new section of this burned down island. Just like that building we traversed earlier, I felt like these kinds of things were missing from this game, as a lot of our journey has been through ravaged and overgrown streets and buildings. Part 1 admittedly suffered from this too, but it also switched up locations throughout the game as we do go from Boston to Utah, so it felt fresh. And Part 2 was inevitably going to struggle with this thanks to the game taking place in one section of Seattle, but this couple hours were a treat to play through. It also helps that we get some very important narrative moments here that have to do with Lev and Isaac. Abby and Yara will eventually find Lev hiding in the corner with their mother dead on the floor. Lev tried to convince his mom to leave the island with him, but she, like many of the Seraphites, don't accept Lev's new identity, and in their scuffle, Lev's mom hit the table, which instantly killed her. Yara knew that their mom wouldn't be able to accept Lev, but Lev had hoped that she would eventually come around to it. At the end of the day, that is his mom, and while they don't get along much, he still appreciates her for raising him, which is why he's so upset over her death. Shortly after finding Lev is where Isaac comes in, as one of the WLF soldiers attempts to kill Yara before Abby takes him down. Isaac is confused why Abby would defend his scar and asks her to back away from him. Even though Abby is more loyal to her friends than Isaac, you can still see that she respects the WLF, as she doesn't kill the guy who shot Yara, and she immediately puts the gun down when Isaac arrives. She's willing to talk this out with him, and even when Isaac refuses and says that she has until the count of three to move, she doesn't do anything. She doesn't shoot anyone or even move because she doesn't want to kill any of the WLF, but she also doesn't want Isaac to kill Lev. Yara takes the opportunity though to shoot Isaac, which gives her enough time to run while the WLF pepper her with bullets. It's around here where we start to see the WLF and Seraphites attack one another, and we do have to kill Abby's old team. But the key thing to remember is that she doesn't want this. She doesn't want to harm any of the WLF, she's only killing them because they shot first, and it's either them or her, and she needs to save Lev. After this is where the island burns down, and we get to see that spectacle I talked about. There are people dying from both sides, and it's unclear who the hell we're even shooting at and who's actually winning. Ultimately, the Seraphites will suffer the most even if they win since their home has been destroyed, but the WLF did send most of their troops here. Isaac said he wants everyone in on this mission, but he could just mean most of the high-value soldiers. If he truly meant everyone, which I doubt, then that would further reinforce that this truly is the battle that will end the war. We never see who wins this though, because ultimately it doesn't matter, not only are the WLF and the Seraphites only used as a plot device to influence the world around our characters, but we also aren't going to be in Seattle after this thanks to what happens right after. As a member, it's day three which means that Owen and Mel are already dead, and once Abby discovers this, she throws up in shock. The scene, I think, is supposed to show how bad this act is now that we've had a few hours to talk with these characters, but this is where a disconnect comes in. In order to see this act as horrific as the game wants you to, you have to accept the fact that they are innocent people, and for many others, including myself, that's not possible. All of this depends on how you view the interaction with Joel. If you believe that only the one who dealt the killing blow is guilty, then everyone is innocent. If not, then they all deserve what's coming to them. Remember when I asked if you took Ellie or Dean aside? I fully agree with Ellie. Each of them traveled hundreds of miles with the sole intention of killing Joel. Even if they weren't too keen on doing it and only did it to help Abby and or regretted it afterwards, they still went and helped. It doesn't matter who delivered the killing blow because they each played their part. This may sound hypocritical given I've spoken at length as to why killing Abby's not the right move for Ellie despite the fact that I don't find her innocent. But if we can love Joel and also recognize that he did some evil things, we sure as hell can agree that Ellie killing Abby would be justified but also recognize that it wouldn't solve anything. This discussion though will inevitably bring up another topic that we could go back and forth on all day. Abby's only doing this because of Joel, and Joel did it because he didn't want to lose Ellie. What each of them did was wrong. Joel killed dozens of people just so that Ellie wouldn't die. Abby brutally murdered Joel simply because she wanted to get revenge, and Ellie murdered hundreds of WLF and a few of Abby's friends without even knowing why they killed Joel in the first place. It's all just unnecessary killing, but we don't see Joel and Ellie as bad people because we're hypocrites. The characters we hate do all the wrong, and the characters we love can do no wrong. And because this is all fiction, we could believe that, and I feel like that's where the disconnect originates from. 
Naughty Dog seems to want you to think that these killings are wrong, but many people see Joel and Ellie as people who can do no wrong. Whew. All right. I think I've talked her ear off enough about Abby's campaign, and I sure as hell am ready to get back to the present, so let's see how this encounter ends, shall we? The same scene plays just like before. Tommy's taken down by Abby, and Jesse gets shot. This is when Abby realizes that Ellie's here. Before they walk in, Lev says, what are we going to do once we find him? This, if we recall her encounter with Tommy earlier, means that she believed Tommy was the one behind all of this and had no idea Ellie was here. Like I said before, flip-flopping between each day wouldn't have made sense for the pace of the game, as we would have arrived at this conclusion at the same time anyway, and Abby and Ellie never meet again until right now, so it failed to create any kind of tension or suspense. That being said, that tension does occur right now, as Tommy, like Yara, stops Abby from shooting Ellie, giving her time to escape, but ends up sacrificing himself in the process. Abby then chases Ellie into the theater, and now the hunt is on, but we don't get to play as Ellie. This was a very brilliant decision for two reasons. One, it forces the player to fight and possibly kill their favorite character. If we played as Ellie, then this wouldn't mean much. We just kill Abby like we wanted to do all game, but now we're being forced to do the opposite. Plus, this removes the possibility of running into a common problem that other games may have. You ever played a boss fight and kick the boss's ass only to lose in the cutscene? Well, that can't happen as we play the victor in this scenario. Even though the fight is neck and neck, Abby's wearing down Ellie blow by blow and will eventually come out of this on top, so it only makes sense to keep things narratively consistent. As for the fight itself, it's basically a copy of David's encounter from part 1. The player only has their melee weapon, or fists in Abby's case, and the person we're running from is much stronger and can only be attacked from behind, as Ellie will easily put you down if you run at her. I also like how they changed up the weapon she uses in each phase, and also not only increased her speed but removed her outline from the listening mode just like David. This was honestly a tough fight. Ellie caught me multiple times during this, and even when it felt like I had the movements down, she would still find ways to outmaneuver me. From a pure mechanical perspective, it's a really well done fight. The fight ends though with Abby punching Ellie before being interrupted by Dina who slashes at her with a knife. Lev backs her up by shooting Dina in the back. Abby then takes Dina and almost kills her before Ellie announces that she's pregnant. Abby was about to kill her anyway before Lev steps in and tells her not to. Many people saw this as proof that Abby should not be sympathized with and that her entire campaign is moot, but it's not as simple as that. Lev, like Dina, is the barrier that protects Abby from going too far. Abby's sort of like an addict in this moment. This is the first time in a long time that she's been able to see the world differently. Lev and Yara changed her perspective on life, and this situation with Dina was almost like a test. It's more comfortable for her to go back to her ruthless and vicious ways, the same ways that led to her being the top scar killer of the WLF. But that's not her anymore, and while she recognizes that now, it's hard to just quit cold turkey. Lev being here though is a reminder of what she's gone through and how much she's changed in the past few days. It's a very pivotal moment for her as she finally goes against her instinct of taking revenge because she's always believed in an eye for an eye. And while she did need some help from Lev to do so, so would anyone struggling with some kind of addiction. It's hard to do this kind of thing on your own and Abby would have not been able to change had it not been for Lev and Yara. That's why these two are so important to her. She wants to be better not just for herself but for them too. Once again, this is why Abby's campaign is so important, as it's showing how Abby is able to overcome her problems, because Ellie's about to go through the same thing, and we don't want her to go down that path. In fact, these feelings of hers are about to be tested right now, as once Abby and Lev leave, we flash forward a few months from now, and Ellie and Dina are living on a farm together with their son, JJ. The scene being placed here is intentional, as we can see how happy Ellie is. Both of these women were angry and filled with rage, but were able to find a way past their grief and urges for revenge by putting that energy into someone else. The issue is that for Abby, she's already dealt with her father's killer. Ellie hasn't, which is why she's still not satisfied with the outcome of Seattle. And even though she tries to forgive and forget, she can't as she has PTSD from that day in Jackson. Her mind is corrupted with thoughts of that day and is even fabricating new memories, as Ellie hears Joel call out to her in pain, which is not how that originally played out. This is why Ellie is so conflicted on what to do. She wants to stay here and enjoy the life she has with Dina and JJ, but she can't go a few minutes without seeing Joel's face beaten and bruised on the hardwood floor. But Ellie isn't alone in her struggle, as Tommy too has suffered quite a bit. Somehow Tommy lived, but not only did he lose an eye and some movement in his leg, but apparently Maria and him are splitting up. We don't know why Maria left him, but we can assume it has something to do with him leaving to go find Abby. Because of Joel, Abby pushed away lots of her friends. Many of them don't talk to her anymore, and the one relationship she had fell apart because of her insistence on killing Joel. Tommy lost his eye, his leg barely works, his brother is dead, and his wife left him. Both of them ended up losing more than they gained in their petty quest to find closure, and Ellie's about to hit this point too. Tommy still won't let go of the revenge, but can't do anything about it thanks to his current condition, so he gives this info up to Ellie. You can tell by the subtle movements in her face that everything she went through in Seattle has come back to her. All the anger, sadness, and fear she experienced has come flooding back. Her mind is going back and forth on what to do. Stay with Dina, go after Abby. 
Staying with Dina and JJ is the smart move, but Abby needs to die. I don't want to leave JJ and Dina behind, but I also don't want to let Abby get away. This might be my only chance to find her, but does it even matter if I find her? All of it is thoroughly conveyed through her sharp breathing, concerned face, and blank stare. Ultimately though, it was enough to convince her as despite her conflicted feelings, she decides to leave that night anyway. To bed. We'll talk about it in the morning, okay? I have to finish it. You don't owe Tommy anything. I don't sleep. I don't eat. I'm, I'm not like you, Dina. What? You think this is easy? For you and for him, I deal with it. I love you. Prove it. Stay. So what? I'm just supposed to, to sit here and wait for you? For God knows how long? Just thinking you're fucking dead the entire time? I don't plan on dying. Yeah, well neither did Jesse. Or Joel. Ellie can't function because of all this, and we know from her journal that it's even worse than she's letting on. Ellie goes hunting in order to get food for the family, and one day she shot a bear, but the way it died reminded her of Joel. Her journal also says, quote, Happened again. Got rid of the images pretty quickly, but my skin hurt the rest of the morning. I gave up trying to go back to sleep. Dina stayed up with me. When will this stop? She believes that stopping Abby is the way to finish this. We know that's not true, but she can't see past it, and Dina is sick of this too, which is why she gives her an ultimatum. If she leaves, Dina and JJ are going back to Jackson, and she won't see them again. Ellie ends up taking the wrong choice, and embarks on her journey to Santa Barbara, which brings us to the final chapter of the game. We first start the chapter with Abby, although don't worry, it's not as long as you think. We play as her first as she's already in Santa Barbara. She came here with Lev to see if what Owen had heard about the fireflies was true. Lev has grown his hair out a bit, and the two continue to still have a very deep appreciation for each other. They work well in combat scenarios, and will often playfully tease each other over small things. She ends up finding their secret base and radio, and ends up getting in contact with some fireflies. These aren't actually fireflies though, as once she leaves the house, the two are jumped by some rattlers. Lev and Abby do the best they can, but the group is too strong. Three of them are able to take down Abby, and Saitama over here knocks Lev out with one punch. The two are then taken away, and we get to play as Ellie. Like I said, it's not as long as you think. Ellie is of course here to find Abby, but she doesn't know where she is. She does manage to find the boat Owen was fixing up, and she uses some of her notes to find her next location. But already, we can see that she's having some doubts about this, and it was only during the trip here. One of her journal entries says that she misses Dina and JJ, and that she's questioning what she's even doing here. She continues anyway, hoping that by the time she'll see her, she'll have her answer. But sadly, her journey will be cut short temporarily, as she's also captured by the same people Abby and Lev were taken by. Thankfully though, she manages to break free using the clicker nearby. Saitama's back and is actually helpful this time around, as he gives Ellie the location of their camp. The Rattler camp is probably the most amount of enemies you'll face at one time, and some of them also have body armor and helmets, making one-shots harder to pull off. As we go through the camp, we can see that they have infected tied up and also have people kept in cages. The Rattlers are without a doubt a group of slavers that keep the infected as guard dogs and use the people they capture as slaves. The conditions these people are kept in are horrible enough that escapees would rather kill themselves than be taken back. Ellie will then eventually make her way to the back of the camp where the slaves are, and in return for rescuing them, they tell her that Abby was taken to the pillars. And even though this section was very short, it might have been one of my favorite parts of the game. Having a striking and unique appearance is a great way to personify a character. The Last of Us doesn't have the benefit though of using fantasy or sci-fi clothing thanks to its more grounded nature, but it's actually that drab look that makes the other features stand out. Ellie may not be recognizable from the clothing she wears, but what about her tattoo? That's pretty noticeable. The same goes for Abby, with her ponytail being her most noticeable design choice, and Naughty Dog is banking on the fact that you know this, so they can trick you later into thinking that this girl on the post is Abby. She's got a ponytail, right? It has to be. Wrong. We've already passed Abby, but you'll be forgiven for missing her given how much she's changed in such a short amount of time. She's lost all her muscle mass and her hair has been cut. She's practically unrecognizable. Her one defining feature is gone, so it's a wonder why she faded into the background during our walk along the beach. Ellie, after realizing that it's Abby, cuts her down, who then rescues Lev. You can tell that she's still contemplating what to do at this moment, and even when the blood of her body reminds her of Joel, she doesn't just kill her. She goes over to Lev and threatens her. If Abby doesn't fight her right here on this beach, she'll kill Lev. 
If Ellie truly wanted to kill Abby, she wouldn't care about honor or the theatrics. She would have just gutted her on that post like the Seraphites were going to. She's so conflicted that she can't even create the moment herself. She has to force Abby to take the lead. Personally, I feel like if you're this far in and still can't make this decision, then it's just not worth it. Thank the prophet Ellie agrees, as right before Abby draws her last breath, she's spared by Ellie thanks to her seeing a memory of Joel. This memory was the same day that the incident with Seth occurred. Ellie came over that night to apologize and talk with Joel, and her final line really drives it home. You're such an asshole. I'm not trying to- I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have fucking mattered. But you took that from me. <sighs> if somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. But I would like to try. I like that. This specific memory being placed here is also intentional because this is the last time the two talked. This happened the night before we started playing, meaning right when they were starting to heal their relationship again, Abby comes by and kills Joel. This gives us even more context as to why Ellie is mad at Abby, not just because she killed Joel, but it was right when they started to talk to each other again. She's probably frustrated at herself and likely wouldn't have attacked Joel this way if she knew this was going to happen. Ellie realizes in this moment though how meaningless all of this has been. She knows that killing Abby won't bring him back, and it likely won't make her feel any better either. If anything, doing this will make things worse as it just keeps the cycle of revenge going. Ellie has to do what Abby did, find something else to put time into so that they can heal. But since she left for Santa Barbara, the road is going to be infinitely more difficult for her to traverse. Her family and friends are dead, and Dina took JJ back to Jackson. She's now entered the place she fears the most. Uh, being by myself? I'm scared of ending up alone. Ellie has lost everything, and she's alone for the first time in years. She even attempts to play the guitar, the one thing she has left, but she can barely do that, thanks to Abby biting her fingers off during the fight. Although, to be fair, it could have just been my inability to swipe the touchpad since all the songs sounded like this anyway, so who knows. Ellie then decides to leave the guitar behind, the same one Joel gave her all those years ago, and go off into the forest, thus bringing us to the end of The Last of Us Part 2. It's still a divisive game, and probably will be till the end of time, but it's one I genuinely enjoyed. It's got its problems, sure, but it's still a great game nonetheless, which made me really happy because that means this whole series is top-notch. Part 1 is fantastic and arguably perfect. Embarking on the journey to Salt Lake alongside Joel and Ellie is an unforgettable experience. Meeting new people was also a great way to bring a breath of fresh air into the pacing, as it allowed the dynamic duo to interact with more people, and those people were also equally as likable as our main cast, even if we didn't get to be with them for a long time. Thanks to this game, Joel and Ellie became some of my favorite characters in gaming, and it's definitely one of those games that I wish I played earlier. Part 2 continued on from Part 1 and started off pretty strong. Seeing Joel die was heartbreaking, but not only does that feeling of sadness show how much we cared about him, but it felt like it was bound to happen. Joel was not going to be able to escape what he did back at the hospital, it's just a shame he went out like that. Nevertheless, the game starts off great and continues to do so throughout most of Ellie's campaign. You feel the hatred that Ellie feels in these moments, but you can also see that she's becoming engulfed by this vengeful journey. She's becoming someone else, someone much different than the one we remember. Abby's campaign was also great, minus the fact that the game was starting to drag in regards to its runtime. Our time with Abby shows us that this act of vengeance did nothing for her. She thought and planned for years as to how she would make Joel pay, but in the end it did nothing for her. She lost her relationship with Owen, Mel hates her, her dad is still dead, and now many of her friends have joined him. The two of these girls experienced the same thing, and basically ended up at the same place. 
but Abby was able to find this piece in Lev, and Ellie would have found it in Dina and JJ had she not gone after Abby. I know Part 2 wasn't liked by many, but it was liked by me, and while I don't consider it to be nearly as good as Part 1, it was definitely a solid sequel, and it's because of that that I can say with absolute certainty that this is a series you should not pass up on. I know they are PlayStation exclusives, which does make it harder to come by, but both are available on the PlayStation 4 and 5, and Part 1 should be dropping on PC in about a week from now. So if you can find a way to play them, then do it, as I can assure you it's one of the greatest series of all time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. I'm glad to finally have this video done, as it took quite a bit of time to make. For now, though, we're going to take things slow, at least in regards to some large videos, as the Resident Evil 4 remake is dropping soon, and I'll probably make a comparison video on that like we did with the Dead Space video about a month ago. As for what we'll do after, well, I'll always update you all in the community post, so be sure to keep those notifications on. With that, though, thank you for watching the video today, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you to my returning viewers for coming back to another video, and take care, everyone. Goodbye.